let's call this meeting to <coughs> order at uh, 8.41 a.m. on this January 26, 2024, and we're five months ahead of when we normally meet to have we this are, discussion. Man. So <laughs> I'm not quite sure how we're going to proceed since we are months away from really mm -hmm. seeing a current trend as it relates to sales tax revenue. Um, which is one of the biggest drivers of the leftover monies that we have to make some flexible decisions. But just to remind everybody that the entire property tax dollars that we receive, plus $5 million out of the sales tax dollars, go to pay, pay for our public safety. In addition to that, we will have to add to that baseline $2.4 million, which is the additional dollars that we gave in paycheck and in pay increases to our fire and police. So when property tax dollars are 50% of the revenue when you add sales tax dollars and property tax to dollars together, then you take the 21, 22 million of sales tax and remove 7.45 million from that, you're left with a much lesser number to be working with, and we need to keep that in focus because we don't have a lot of actuals because we're months ahead of our normal time period for budget planning. So when we talk today, it's going to be a more global, bigger picture because we don't have real numbers to really work with. It's conceptual at this point. We have a sales tax trend line right now, which is not as positive as it has been. And I also want to remind everybody that uh, where we have overachieved our sales tax dollars over the past few years, it is because we've planned conservatively, meaning that our sales tax dollars have been planned down over the previous years. So our overperformance is relative to a smaller trend line, meaning negative, which is what we've planned. So if you take a look at our actual sales trend numbers, they don't exceed inflation. So inflation is greater than our sales tax trend. So keep that in mind as we move into this session. So with that, uh, we are going to start with our workshop itinerary, which is, uh, first of all, 2A is the overview of strategic priority setting workshop. Mayor, that and is my... I think you're on. Yes, ma'am, I am on. Thank you for the overview, Mayor. I'll give my overview as well. Yes, we do have some, some pretty big challenges, actually, that need to be addressed. But part of our, our planning and the reason why we're starting early this time around is to make sure that we have a plan for those challenges that we'll be facing. We're very aware of the, the fact that we do take a look at our sales tax numbers. We take, take a look at everything. We're very conservative. We have been very conservative in our approach as far as our financing. But regardless, we do want to make sure that uh, the staff has a really good direction, uh, guidance when it comes to those strategic priorities, because that's kind of what we do plan around. And I will say that regardless of what we plan for today and what those priorities are, we're very well aware of those financials. As those numbers come in, Mayor, we may have to make adjustments to whatever um, those priorities were. They, they maybe came up today. Well, we won't change the priorities. We just simply change the dollar commitment to them because well, our priorities won't change. Well, the yes, we've had the same priorities for the past six years, which is infrastructure, public safety, and economic development. But this also gives city council members an opportunity because I've heard from council members some of the concerns or some of the areas that they'd like for us to address. And that's really what I'd like to get into today is to make sure that we get those items addressed so we can speak, uh, speak to those uh, more specifically. Uh, I do have staff here to answer any questions or delve into whatever it is that city council um, brings up as far as uh, what they would prefer to consider as a priority as well, Mayor. But uh, again, on our end, uh, this was intended to be a very informal meeting, kind of like sitting around the table, drinking coffee and having a discussion. And this is really what I would love to see happen today. Let's have that discussion. The discussions that I've had with city council members on the priorities that they've spoke to me about, let's put those out there. Let's talk about that. Uh, we can create a, a uh, as far as the level of priorities off of that list as well. I mean, who knows? The city council members have been saying, hey, let's stick to the three we have right now. 
But again, regardless, I just wanted to make sure that we went into that topic, we talked about those strategic priorities, and we had those listed on there. But one of the things, too, Marin, you mentioned a while ago, we do have a section. Actually, the only presentation we're seeing today from staff will be from Tina and her staff to talk about the revenues and expenditures. And in order for us to really accomplish some of the things that we want to get done with our strategic priorities, we need to make sure that we have the funding for that. So what does that mean from the revenue standpoint? That, of course, that means we need higher revenues. What does that mean from the expenditure standpoint? Lower revenues. You know, so you have to come up with a, a way to pay for these strategic priorities that we'll be uh, establishing today. Again, I don't know if we'll maintain the, the top three. I suspect we will. Uh, because they're they're the core of what the services we actually provide as a city. Talk about that, Daniel. Mm -hmm. From a public perspective and from a city perspective mm -hmm. across the country, what is the primary obligation the city has? You know, safety. You look at uh, the safety for a community. Public safety is something that if you were to ask our citizens, what exactly is it uh, that you want for our community? And they would say public safety, which is what we have on, what is one of our priorities. But the next one is water, streets, uh, the infrastructure, the drainage, the, the wastewater. You'll hear, you'll hear that immediately. So that's why I know that we've had these top three priorities. And those two priorities that I talked about are high in the exp in expenditure level. So that's why we have economic development there as a priority as well. So to help assist with paying for those, uh, those priorities that we have, we want to make sure that we're addressing economic development very strongly to make sure that we have those monies coming in as well. But again, as I mentioned a while ago, it's not just the economic development portion of it. We also have to address the revenues and expenditures to make sure that we shore those up, that we're as efficient as we possibly can, and still maintain a very conservative budget like we have in the years that uh, I know Tina's, Tina's come on board. I've been here for 11 years, been very conservative with the way that we've done things, and we'll continue doing so. But today really is about that discussion. What are those challenges that we're facing in our community or some of those things that we can improve upon that we should be taking a look at? And this is our opportunity, city council members, your opportunity at this point to start talking about those. We went very low tech this time around. We have a, a paper board up here, okay? So um, we have Michelle that'll be here writing down all of your ideas, your thoughts that you feel you feel we should actually be taking a look at as some of those priorities. And again, you may just decide Daniel or say, hey Daniel, I think we're, I'm super great with uh, those top three priorities. Just leave those alone. I don't have anything else to add to that. Or you may say, you know what? Those three are fantastic. We need to keep those. However, we need to talk about others that are a concern for me. With that, um, again, this is just a quick overview. Uh, as I mentioned a while ago, uh, we wanted to start really early because we do have some challenges, especially this fiscal year. A lot of cities will have this challenge. We do have a 3.5% limitation on current values when it comes to our property tax revenues. And that's caused our property tax rate to go down over the years. And Tina will really focus in on that and talk about what that's meant to the city and how much uh, monies, revenues, we've actually lost over the years. And so we'll have a discussion about that. Not too, too much of an in-depth discussion. Really the goal today is just to get the city council, make city council members aware of the, some of the items that we'll be looking at. And we'd love to be able to come back at a later workshop and say, hey, from the direction we got from y'all, we, this is what we came up as far as a plan to address this revenue source, uh, this revenue item, this, uh, this expense item, and we can come back later on and say, hey, this is how we can do it. But right now, it's just really a discussion. So when we all came into office, or most of us came into office, we heard aggressively from all of our citizens that one of their number one priorities was streets. Mm -hmm. Streets. Our streets were in a terrible position. Streets. And with that, we created an $80 million bond or applied for an $80 million bond to start the reconstruction of some major projects. So if you take 2017 and add 20 years to that, you're looking at 2037. That $80 million will be obligated by when? Next year? Well, no. I mean, as far as the, the payback, Tina, you want to talk Not a bit about? Not the payback. The projects that fund that $80 million. Mm -hmm. So those projects... And, or the financing of that first $80 million is on most of our major streets. And that work, spending that $80 million, will be done when? And yet, give me a deadline or give me a time frame on it and know that it won't be paid for until 2037. And before that date arrives, there's going to be many other street repairs projects will need to be done. And that means we will have to relook 
at where we go on another bond to pay for more street work. Is that correct, Tina? What, what's your assumption there? Is, so we'll be paying on that first $80 million until 2037? Until, yes, I think that's correct. Um, we have uh, been working with Vince, so to look at what our capacity is, and I've also been talking with Patrick and Shane and Public Works um, to see when we would need to issue the next. We've issued four out of five of our planned um, issues for street debt. Um, they are at a point where we, we would have issued it the fifth out of five um, in the spring of this year. They're at a point where they have enough funding right now to get through the projects they have going so that we're going to push that next street debt issue out until the spring of next year. But we'll have Shane at some point come forward and talk about um, the streets and what's out there and, and what uh, still needs to be done. With that, we also know and we have experienced over the past few years that what we thought some of these projects would cost have dynamically increased in costs that the original projections in terms of, for example, College Hills, what we thought College Hills project was going to cost us is now what? Many millions more, right, Shane? Yeah. So we, we need to make sure that we don't lose focus on what the citizens have said are key priorities. And streets have been one of those key priorities. So infrastructure, continues to be a focus and will continue to take a tremendous chunk of money to finish the work. So we want to keep that in mind. Public safety, we know consistently the public has said support and fund the public safety issues. And it's bigger than just the salaries. Salaries are definitely a key issue. But they also have needs and wants beyond salary issues. And those issues most of them, in terms of what they are, are big ticket items. They're not small dollars. So those are going to have to be looked at as well. And I'm not sure how we can make either the infrastructure or public safety um, not topics of high mm -hmm. uh, support from the citizens, and I assume from city council, because those are the two big priorities that city, city hall, if you will, is responsible for making sure happens. Yeah. What those dollars are, Shane can give us better ideas than any of us up here have, but they're not small. The Lake Nasworthy project came in how many millions more than we thought it would cost us? Yeah, I did. Um, Mary, and we do understand all those things, of course, on our end. Um, we've always, there's years that uh, we had a year where we're short $2 million, and we cut back our expenditures to make sure that we ended up at the end of the year in the black. So we understand all those things, and yes, there are, there are major challenges. But on our end, uh, we would never recommend a budget to any of the city council members that would put us on a hole. You know, so again, even with, yeah. even with what you just said a while ago, whatever city council members talk about today, which I'm looking forward to that, I want to hear from all the council members as far as what it is that they would like to see as those parties. As I mentioned a while ago, Mayor, it may be just stick to these three, or it may be other items that they want to discuss, but we want to have that discussion because at some point, once we start looking at these revenues and expenditures, we may have to come back and say, guys, we know that y'all wanted all these um, priorities in there, but quite frankly, we can't finance some of those. We just can't do it. But what we want, though, as staff, is some of that direction on what city council would love to see on there as some of that, those priorities. And uh, again, thank you, Mayor, for all that input. I think that's valuable information that we should keep at heart and in mind as well. But again, I know that hearing from council members, I've heard enough that there's other parties that, want, that uh, they would like to have considered. So with that said, uh, that's why we had the, the, the board up here, and we're ready to start writing at this point. Okay, so um, I guess we're in the Section B, 2B, that says top three street st strategic priorities. So do you want to start with um, city council input on infrastructure, comments? Yes, ma'am. I mean, that'd be great. At this point, again, uh, we didn't have it structured as a, a staff coming up here and doing a big old presentation on any of these items. It's more of a, let's delve into one of these, uh, these three issues in a second. What specifically would you like to see happen in any of these? Or just say, hey, no, these are the ones that we want to maintain as those top three strategic priorities. We just want to add more to it or just leave it alone. But yes, we can delve into infrastructure, public safety, and economic development and talk a little bit more about 
what is it that we'd like to accomplish for infrastructure this year? And I think that we pretty much already have a plan on infrastructure and what we need to be doing for this coming year, right? So then we look at public safety and we ask, what specifically is it that we want to accomplish for public safety this year? We have both chiefs here today uh, to be able to come up here and say, hey, these are some of the concerns that we've had that we'd like to maybe address with this coming fiscal year. Uh, economic development, uh, Mike is here. I know that we've t talked a lot, Mayor, about uh, airport, and we wanted to do, you, you talked about trains, planes, and automobiles, and the focus has been on, uh, on planes this time around. So we could have a good, healthy discussion about that portion of it as well and say, okay, what is it specifically that we want to accomplish in economic development as well? Well, the, the conversation about economic development was certainly planes, trains, and automobiles. Mm -hmm. But the overriding statement was maximizing our assets, making sure that we're reinvesting back on the assets that are important to this community. And the airport was one of them. And we have Absolutely. seen that the investment made into the airport will have a long-term big picture impact on this community. But with that, there also was campuses, first and foremost, on Lake Nasworthy. Because in order to maximize our asset of Mathis Field, we could not do, couldn't talk about, couldn't even plan for until we had the Lake Nasworthy sewer project underway. Because the growth and development of that airport is dependent on, number one, sewer capacity. We can't have those projects out there being successful. We couldn't even approve them or even had the conversation about them without the Lake Nas Nasworthy as sewer project being funded and being worked on as we speak today. That's correct, Mary. So Absolutely. the hen before the egg, the egg before the hen, well, I'm not sure which is egg or hen, but what I do know is sewer. <laughs> and the sewer mm -hmm. project had to happen before we could talk about the airport project. But we've seen the result of mm -hmm. that, and that project is not even completed yet, and yet it is a, because of that project, it is allowing us to have some big picture, dramatic, uh, big picture projects being put together at that airport. And there will be a huge impact for this community with that project. Yes, so again, hen before the egg, egg before the hen, yeah. um, I'm not sure how that works out. But what I do know, bless you, Thank you, is that sewer project was long in coming, really needed, not only for uh, economic development, but for the safety of this city. I repeat that cast iron sewer line underneath Lake at Nasworthy, which is one of our key water resources, should it, it uh, create any larger leaks than exist currently, there went our water supply. And we are at risk. Mayor, and uh, great point. I know that uh, what we're doing with that project, we're actually multiplying the capacity about five times. Yeah. So right now, we have an investment in that project, and I'm excited to see what the return on investment is going to be in the near future because you are going to see um, investment out there as well, and building out there as well. Uh, so that's, that's a great point. Again, that's why economic development has been a focus and a priority for all these years because it has such a big impact on us as well. Well, and, I, and we want to be clear about the word economic development because we have Costa DC, which is the City of San Angeles Development Corporation. When we talk about economic development as a priority for this city, it's separate from what Costa DC does. And I say that for the reason I just brought up Lake Nasworthy. Costa DC cannot be, will not be, and could not be responsible for Lake Nasworthy sewer project. We had to take care of the infrastructure as an economic development opportunity in order to make the airport economic development projects happen. Mm -hmm. And so you look at it again, and so when we talk about economic development here, we're not talking about the work that our Costa DC folks do. We're talking about the infrastructure issues that provide for opportunities to come to the table for Costa DC or for organizations like ASU programs to happen. Mm -hmm. All of that under one umbrella. But we're not here to take away from Costa DC's work. Their work is different than our work. Their work is to bring in new things, to help grow existing things. Ours is to make sure that we invest the dollars to allow for economic development opportunities to happen. Significant Very difference. Very good, Mayor. Mayor, at this point, uh, again, these three have been our Boy, I tell you what, uh, we've really concentrated on those for the last six years. 
really what I would like to do at this point then is just move forward and start hearing from council members um, about their, let's say their top three strategic parties. Uh, they could say, hey, you know what, let's stick to what we have at this point, but I say, well, let's, let's stick to the three we have, but I still have one or a couple that I have to, to really address. And again, it doesn't mean that we're gonna fund those projects. We're gonna have to find a way to fund that, Mayor. But it means that at least we're taking a look at it and saying, hey, this is what the city council members came up with that they felt were also a priority that needs to be considered. So when we start looking at funding the top three, we also have to look at funding whatever else is, is placed on that board. If the city council gives us that direction as a quorum to say, hey, these are our top priorities. So, Mayor, with that, I really would love to hear from the council members at this point to say, okay, let's start talking about those priorities. What do they look like and what, what we'd like to see uh, staff address here this coming year? Larry, I'm gonna put you on first. I saw something about two weeks ago that was talking about uh, the favor favorable atmospheres of cities. And the one hit that Goodfellow, or excuse me, that St. Angelo took was street structure. Was and what? Streets. Yes. Uh, folks that are coming in here to live, those that are looking for employment, companies that are talking about coming in, that was the one item that stood out like a sore thumb among everything else. And believe me, there was plenty of positive things about St. Angelo, and that was the only tick down there that, that uh, stood in the way of their feeling as, as good as they could about a town. I'm glad you brought up Goodfellow because the other big objective and the big crisis that they've had out there is affordable living. Housing has been a major issue as it relates to Goodfellow Air Force Base on campus as well as off campus. One of the great things that we did perhaps three years ago, four years ago, Michael, you might, Michael, Michael Dane. <laughs> <laughs> he heard you, Mary. He's going to sneak out of here. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> And that was, we did what we call a housing study. Yep. And that housing study is one of the key issues and one of the key things that we uh, found a way to get the money to do the housing study. And that housing study was very important as it related to people from outside our community coming into our community and doing things like new apartment complexes. It gave a focus to what affordable housing looks like based off of income levels in the city of San Angelo. And I would say relative to Goodfellow conversation that we're how many years into that? Four years, five years into the housing study? What I believe we probably need to do is relook as a priority at that housing study. We've had a lot of development. We've had a lot of increase in the number of, of homes available, apartments available, et cetera. But we need to make sure that we're on top of what we call affordable housing. And that means not low income. We're talking about if you make $100,000 a year, what percent of that money needs to go towards rent or a mortgage? Yes, Michelle, you have housing a look study. on your I'm face. I'm put housing study up there. Thank you. Study on the next to it. Housing study. And when I, when I talk about housing and affordability, which was one of the key issues, not only in terms of Goodfield Air Force today's base, but workforce. Because you can't recruit workforce if you don't have housing that suits the income level. So we talked a lot about early on about income and about wages, and that is making sure that we find opportunities to bring companies to town where we aren't talking about minimum wage, but a living wage. Housing is key. And I take a look at some of the statistics over the past few years. And in 2020, for example, 47% of the homes sold were under $200,000. The median home price was $197,000. In 2021, 36.8% sold was under $200,000 the median home price was $200,000. 2022, 32.6% were under $200,000. Median home price, 230. In December of 2023, the me median home price was $275,000. So 
So as we talk about workforce, as we talk about um, Goodfield Air Force Base, and we talk about the quality of home and what goes into housing, we need to make sure what our market is telling us we need to do. And then how do we make sure programs are there to help make that happen? When we got that housing study and we were starting to take a look at some of the areas where um, we should invest in, we created an infill program. And that infill program, in fact, allowed for development in Lakeview, which hadn't happened for decades. Mm -hmm. Decades. But along the way, land prices have gone up. Along the way, commodity prices, the cost of lumber, the cost of many other things have gone up. Some of the reason the median home price has gone up is the following reason, because the cost of building a home is much more expensive. And what people are getting in the homes might not be the same thing they could get in a home when the median home price was $197,000 because costs have gone up. So I'm glad you brought up Goodfield Air Force Base because we know that they're one of the largest employers in this city. And they're important in terms of what we provide for quality of life and housing for them as well. Okay. Karen. Okay. Uh, complete agreement with all of the issues brought forward so far. I'd like to add three more for conversation. First of all, our overall, um, shall we say, uh, let's call it workforce stabilization. There's a lot of moving parts there, and we'll want to hear from HR to help us understand what we're confronting. Uh, but there are some concerning pieces of that. I would also add that I continue to be uh, of the belief that our comprehensive plan needs updating as we move toward the future, as we move toward hiring a new planning and development services director. We need to have them uh, armed with a playbook that is timely and appropriate for the needs of the city at this moment, um, which is no shade at all on the one that we have, but it is outdated. And third, I am interested in an ordinance update. As it relates to the comprehensive plan, the big challenges that I think exist with that is, number one, the big picture on the comprehensive plan probably will never change. It's within that comprehensive plan that things change, and the zoning Correct. issue is the number one issue within that comprehensive plan. I would Not agree. the overriding comprehensive plan, but the segment within that plan. I would agree with that. Because things haven't changed. Where, where houses are being built hasn't changed dramatically, except for Lakeview, which has a, had a big change in terms of new development out there. The issues that keep coming up are zoning issues. And what we keep bringing to the table are zoning issues to address whether it should be single family, multifamily issues, as well as other zoning issues within those areas. We know that things have changed dynamically in terms of what's happened in our neighborhoods. We know that today Dollar General has had huge success in every community across the country. You know why? Because they like running a couple blocks away mm -hmm. for a loaf of bread. Mm -hmm and some milk instead of having to go clear out to the big box store that is a 20 minute. And that points to a neighborhood focus, yes, which I, I think that we need to be mindful of. And, and we've heard other complaints that, um, uh, complaints have come before us or concerns have come before us that are related to that very fact, STRs. Mm -hmm. um, the placement of STRs, mm -hmm. ADUs. It's been a big debate issue across the country, so indeed. we're not saying that. And it will be that. a debate for years to come. Uh, another yeah. reason why I underscore the importance of having that converse conversation so that we're prepared to go forward. Yeah. Neighborhoods. Yes. Neighborhoods. Lucy. Um, I hate to beat this to the ground, but <laughs> beat it. <laughs> the, the streets again. In 2015, when I came on, they were just starting to start fixing them and everything. And I tell you what, that was one thing that was a big issue back then. People complained constantly about uh, the Bell Street. Bell Street used to be the worst of the worst. MLK, College Hills. I mean, I think we need to pat each other on the back and say we have done really well. I like to look at the positive, and I think that as far as streets have gone in the last eight years, 
we have done really well. We're still doing good as far as everywhere you look in town, there is street progress going on. So I still feel that that is, is a priority that we should keep. Um, of course, there's a lot of things that the public want. Uh, like we say, wants and needs are totally different, but if we can afford it, uh, they, they've always brought up in the C CIP as far as the splash pad. They've been wanting that for a very long time. So um, that's something that, that we've already looked into. A lot of stuff that I have thought of, we're in the progress of, of doing it. It's starting. It's, it's going forward. So for that, I'm very appreciative. Thank you. H Harry. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I'm trying something new so that I can hear <clears throat> Mr. Miller at the end down here. Uh, <laughs> as, as, as somebody that's hearing disabled, this works very well. Thank you. Uh, so I have to agree with everything that's been said so far. Uh, you know, we really need to look next year about streets. Uh, we need to see how we're going to revamp that. Uh, that was a 10-year project in 2015, just before I came on council. Uh, Lucy was there. She was one of the ones that voted for that. Uh, but we've got to redo that. Uh, we've got many streets out there that still need uh, attention. What I'd like to do is, is talk about how we can better utilize the city's assets to generate additional income. Uh, lake, airport, uh, Lily Garden, parks, Coliseum, fairgrounds, Spur Arena, Convention Center, River, River Stage, yay. Yeah, all of those things. Uh, and if they need to be upgraded for us to, to uh, get some more income, what does that cost? Uh, and how many partners would be willing to help us do those things? So I think that's a way to, to look at bringing in, and, and I've been a proponent of this uh, ever since I've been on council, and that's public-private partnerships. We've got to do those things, continue to do those things. Uh, we are never going to be able to, at least in my lifetime, uh, be able to fund everything that the citizens need. Uh, there's just not enough uh, revenue out there to do that. So from my pr perspective is, is let's find what we can do to uh, upgrade these facilities if we need to to generate more income and let's find partners out there that will help us do that. Uh, I've been having conversation with several people in the community uh, about the possibility of uh, increasing the capacity uh, at, uh, uh, out, out at the Coliseum. And there are some dollars out there that are available. How much is that going to cost? How much is, are they expecting the city to, to input on that? All those things are things that we need to continue to look at. Uh, and I just don't, I think there's things out there that we, we want to work on all the time. But the bottom line from my perspective is this is, how can we generate more income, and what's that cost going to do to do that? Harry, I'm so glad you brought up seven, several key points that we have talked about over the past few years, and one is very important, and that's the public-private partnerships. Some of the greatest things going on right now, Lucy brought up one, and that's the splash pads. Next level is another major public-private partnership, Spring Creek Marina, another public-private partnership. You take a look at those, and they are people who stepped up, who took the responsibility and the vision to help add amenities to our city and take and took a lot of the cost of those facilities away from the city using the things that we have, and that was land. We had land and facilities. They took those and have made great projects out of them. So I think Harry's exactly correct. The public-private partnerships are something we really need to look at. And I also say the following. We can't get started and then stop and then go over and do another project. Start and stop and not complete the work. That river stage is one of the great assets that we have. We've started the work on it. 
we got to complete some of those upgrades before we venture off and go spend money on another project and get started. Public-private partnerships are key. And I'm glad you brought that up, Harry. It's significant, and it will bring some of the greatest things to facilities that this community has. So great points. Thank you. Tom. I think as we sit here on council, we look at the first three items there, infrastructure, public safety, and economic development. We can't ever lose that as our focus. There are things we have under there that we wish we could do that we might be able to implement as it's part of our daily job function, but I'm with Harry. We have to focus on things that are revenue. But we all campaigned on infrastructure, um, public safety, and economic development. A lot of our problems with infrastructure, San Angelo is so far off the beaten path, we can't get people to bid what we want to do. Our costs for doing construction and things fall down to one bidder, nobody will bid against them, and it has caused those costs to double. We have to realize basically as a municipality, you know, we're, I won't say we're broke, but we're flat. Um, so focus on things that generate revenue. If there's some things we have, I remember years ago, Daniel provided a sheet that said, here's a list of 20 things San Angelo provides that other cities do not provide. Should we keep funding these things? Um, I think the ease of which people can work with our city, which goes back to what Karen says on staffing, is something that brings in people that want to do construction, something that helps our own development group is like, if it's somebody that's easy to work with and we can get things done in a very quick time, that's what we need to focus. But I, I think when it all boils back down to it, I don't want to leave this term in two years, not saying our primary focus wasn't infrastructure, um, securing our water out to 2050, 2070. I just don't think we can leave here without putting our focus on that. And there's things we just have to deal with our handicap of being in San Angelo that we can't get five people to come build a construction pro you know, project. And, I, and it's, it's hard and it's terrible. Uh, you hear lots of people, we need splash pads. We you know, are, are talking about all of these things which have already been brought up. It's great, but somehow you can only pay, you can only get what you can afford. And we have to remind people, your tax dollars basically pay for public safety. All right, that's all they do. Everything else comes from sales tax and other points of revenue. We need to streamline what we have, focus on it, and move forward. So, I mean, with that, we stick to the same three. That home safety is public safety, not home safety. Yeah. Thank you. I'm good. Okay, Tom, Tommy. We don't get one thing accomplished without employees, not one. I am embarrassed to say we have talked very little except for the last three years about how we pay our employees. I would like for us to add as a priority, Daniel, um, compensation for our employees um, and make that a priority. I think we had that as a, as a priority maybe when I came on council back in 2017. <clears throat> it was actually a priority that, that was established, uh, actually went out probably uh, about eight years ago, but it was an item in, that was- Anyway, I would like to make that as a, a I think if, if we um, had, a, had a presentation from HR that, you know, we, we've got some, some structural issues in our compensation plan that need to be addressed. Um, and um, I, I have had a couple of folks, employees, tell me if I could have the best employees, you know, I could get the same or more work done with fewer employees. To me, having the best employees and the best paid employees in the long run would save us money. Um, so, Daniel, I, I would like to add um, employee compensation um, to, our, to our list or for our, for our discussion. Thank you. What I like about this conversation is that we remain solid in terms of what we believe are the key um, areas of investment and focus, and definitely infrastructure, no question about that. Uh, we will want to understand uh, as it relates to infrastructure and water an update on the Concho River water project because that's one of the projects that are out there. 
We know um, as it relates to water, there's some big investment projects attached to that, the treatment facility, um, et cetera. So we'll, mm -hmm. and as we always do, as we have a great overview of where we stand in terms of the projects, uh, priorities within that project, uh, we've invested lots of million dollars into water projects. But you can't have economic development and you can't have a city if you don't have water. Water is economic development. And so, again, when we talk about economic development, it sounds like this, you know, two words that other people would describe in different ways. But economic development is making sure we have the water. Economic development is making sure we have the infrastructure in place. And it does mean that if we get those things done, that we can, in fact, find ways to drive revenues because of that, just like we will be doing at that airport. And just like we will be doing with the train, uh, the, the rail port uh, projects. Those were things that we said we wanted and needed as a part of the planes, trains, and automobiles. The only thing that's heading, uh, holding us back on the train issue is this thing called Border Patrol, <laughs> Customs and Border Patrol. The bridge is there, the rail's there, Everything's there except for the Customs and Border Patrol equipment. They're ready to go. Everything's been held up. I was in Austin um, Wednesday, and the conversation was all about um, text dot um, transportation. And consistently, everybody said what we need to do is get those rail lines working for us, because for every truck that you can take off the highway and put on a train, you save a lot of wear and tear on our highways. Yeah. I forget the statistics. Somebody might remember it, but it's something like 20, 20 trucks on a car load. Tremendous amount of pressure taken off of our highways if, in fact, we can get the train going. We've invested. We have a, another private-public partnership there. We just got to get the federal government and the state government to get that Border Patrol Customs and Border Patrol open at uh, Presidio. So with that, Daniel, I think we as a group have agreed that the uh, top three strategic priorities mm -hmm. remain the same. They do, Mayor. Um, the, the concern that I have right now is so we do have our top three, and I absolutely 100% agree with those th top three. Uh, I know that there's other uh, items that, were, that I've talked to with council members as well that haven't been brought up yet, so I'm not sure if council members have anything else to add to that, uh, what we have on there, or if this is what we'll discuss right now. I would, what, do want to have a more in-depth discussion, but Harry, go ahead. Uh, I, I, I guess I was a little bit remiss by not bringing this up, but Tommy said it well. We've got to find a way to pay our employees, keep them. We've had particular positions open for a number of months, in years, whatever the case may be, simply because our pay structure was not up to date. We couldn't pay those particular individuals what the going rate was. So we've got to do that. We've got to do it from the top all the way down to the, to the bottom. And we've got to continue to work on that. You know, we've handled public safety. We've done that, taking care of the police and fire department. Now we got to do everybody else. And, and those people that have been on the council with me for a long period of time know that this has one, been one of my priorities. I had a conversation with Brian last week. Uh, I hope he's, he's able to bring a, a uh, bring together uh, some things that will show us what we need to do and so that we can look at this. But just like everything else, uh, it's money. So how, how, do we, how do we continue to pay for those types of things? But if we don't pay for the employees, how can we do it the rest of the stuff? Move on. So we're, we've established and confirmed the strategic priorities for 24-25. So we'll go down we, to D, funding and council direction. Man, we still don't have, I mean, I'm sorry. Before we move on, I'm sorry. I just want to make sure that we all, it seems like we all agree that the top three should be the top three, right? We've had other items that have been listed on there as well that I just want to make sure that I'm clear on this, 
because before we move on, are we saying that all we want right now at this point is just going to be the top three? Because if that's the case, then we can focus on that. I do want to correct something, though. I just want to make uh, not so much a correction, but just to kind of clear something up. Harry made a comment about uh, we did a lot for the police officers, the firefighters this past year. We did enough to actually catch them up to 85 percent, up to where the rest of the staff was at. Um, that's still going to be a, a bone of contention. It really is a point of contention uh, this year. So how do we pay for that? Uh, that's going to be a question that needs to be addressed. Uh, public safety still is not where it has to be, and staff still is not where it has to be either. So is that going to be a priority or not? Um, that's something that I want to make sure is cleared up. It sounds to me like I heard three council members mention one item, which was Harry, Tommy, and I believe um, Karen as well. And that was the compensation plan. So is that another one that needs to be included on there? I, that's the one that was uh, multiple for city council members aside from the top three priorities. So I just want to make that clear. That's something that city council wants to see. Well, I want to be very clear on what I think I heard, and that is public safety. Public safety is about compensating our police and fire. And so that isn't just... Um, we need another fire station. It is about compensation within the public safety category. And there was work done on that, but the work is not over. It is not over. And we know that those are going to be big topics of conversation for us going forward. Mm -hmm. We're not through with dealing with public safety as it relates to compensation. That That's is still out there. That is, do not think that that conversation was had, is done, and it's over. It isn't. Mm -hmm. So let's be clear on that. Okay. So public safety pay is, is important. So I've also heard employee pay in general is important as well, Mayor. So I just, again, clarification. Is that clear? Let me, let, me, let me piggyback off something Harry said. Um, he alluded to this. I was sitting there trying to run through in my head the open positions that uh, – we, we, we have a uh, city engineer that's been in open position for over two years. Um, we've got um, economic development director that's in open position. We've got planning director that's an open position. We've got water utilities director. Um, we've got an assistant water utilities director that are open positions. Why can't we find these people? Because we can't pay them. We just can't. We, we're not competitive. So it, in my opinion, we need to make employee compensation overall, including public safety, yes, but overall a strategic priority to get where we want to be. Um, we're, we're saying we want to do all these things. Okay, well, we've got to have the, 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 the people to, to, to do those things. So um, from my standpoint, Daniel, I'd like to, I'd like to see added um, to the to the list um, employee compensation. Now I may I may be in the minority, so so be it. But that that's that's a big one for me. Well, I also want to add to that because when you start talking about employees, compensation is always one important element. But we also have to address the fact that San Angelo, Texas, is located in West Texas. There are there is major growth, major development. Bigger cities, larger cities, are growing by leaps and bounds. We're growing, but we're not at the same level, these larger cities. And so when employees are looking at San Angelo, it's not always just about what we pay, pay being important, but it's what we have, what we have is quality of life here within the city of San Angelo. Is this where they want their families to live? Is, is the housing that's provided here in San Angelo, Texas, equivalent to the housing and the pricing in other markets. What are the quality of life issues that they're looking for in this city? It's not just about pay, although pay is very important. Do not I'm not diminishing those comments and what, what's up here. But quality of life is key. The amenities that we talked about earlier in terms of things like Lake Nasworthy is one of our greatest quality of life facilities that we have. It's huge. Mayor, with Flash that. Pads. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. So I've always said that Tommy has a way of, of, of speaking. He he wordsmiths a lot of items that I wish I could I could do that. I'm more direct. But Mr. Hebert just said something very direct. We've got 
to be able to figure out how to pay our employees. And I'm going to guarantee you that as long, I have still got three years left up here. That's going to be my priority. I'm going to continue to do that. Yes, we've got to do this. We've got infrastructure. We've got public safety. We've got economic development. We're going to do those things. But we're going to, you've always heard me say for the last seven plus years, we've got to take care of everybody that works for the city. I'm going to back first responders every time. And I tell the chiefs this whenever I have a conversation with them. But we've got to take care of the rest of the employees, too. So I want to see Brian and his team bring together a, a, something that we can look at that it will help us keep and hire the best employees that we can do that. Mayor, if I may. Um, so I know that, Tommy, you mentioned the, the director level positions, assistant director level positions. I, I do want to point out as well that uh, the standard for a city would be about 4 to 5 percent vacancy. Right now, the city sits at close to 12 percent. Is that correct, Brian? That's what I heard from yesterday. Uh, sits at about 12 percent. You know, that's a pretty high number, probably three times more than what a standard would be. So there, there is an issue there that really does need to be addressed. So again, that's why I wanted to make sure that we had a clarification on what those priorities are. And it's clear to me right now, again, those top three will remain the top three, and they, they should remain the top three. But again, this one uh, is one that I, I keep hearing about as well. And I just want to make sure that on our end, we're doing everything we possibly can. Mayor, I agree with you. The quality of life of this community is wonderful. I think that uh, living here, uh, it's a great place to live. Uh, a lot of times when we do advertise, um, we hope that people will consider the quality of life and come and, and actually interview with us because of that. But really what we're finding out more and more is that we have to offer just a little bit more money to entice people to, to apply and actually come and interview here. So that is a major challenge that we face. But it's also, again, when you have a 12% or close to a 12% vacancy, that's very problematic as well. Now, we were, have been in several meetings over the past couple weeks, and what we hear from people on a regular basis is, why San Angelo? Why San Angelo? We heard this a lot yesterday, and it's about having a home here. And the biggest attraction tends to be family, because I have family here. I wanted to come back to San Angelo because I have family here. And so we need to make sure that the word of mouth, the quality of life that we offer here, continues to be at the level where family encourages family to move back here. And that's a big part of our future employment, employee um, whole to find employees. We've got to make sure we're making the existing citizens of San Angelo happy with San Angelo, making it a place they want to call home so somebody else can choose San Angelo to call home and to have a career here. Okay, okay so I think we're done with A, B, and C, and we will move on to funding and council direction, which, Tina, lady, yes. you're on. Mm -hmm. So just to clarify, though, following up that discussion, for our record-keeping purposes, are we remaining with top three, or are we, do we have a fourth now being employee compensation? Can I get some clarity on that, please? Well, I think we've decided it's a fourth item. Okay. Okay, good. I just want to make sure we have that going forward so we know what to put in our budget book and stuff like that. So. May I seize the moment and also point out that while I fully agree with the mayor's comments and, and actually ran on that platform, um, and, believe it with my whole heart that we want to make the best city. We want to make our city attractive to the people who are here so that they stay here, so that we preserve the things that are good about it. I agree with Harry that we want to leverage the assets we have to underscore that decision that people make as individuals and as families and to attract other people um, to come here and remain here. But I also want to, before we leave the compensation conversation behind in this moment, that the vacancies at leadership levels are deeply concerning to me. Without leadership, we have chaos, basically. So um, we, should, we should be careful where we make the investment. We understand that we don't have an unlimited 
bucket of money, but we need leadership in key positions and we need to make some changes to make that possible. And we need to honor the people that have been faithful for all the reasons that the mayor has pointed out. Okay. I'd like to talk a little so, bit about that too, oh, ma'am. Yes. Um, that was a wonderful meeting we had yesterday about destination marketing and we all got a chance to chat about the wonderful things that San Angelo is. But when people haven't been here before, they don't understand that quality of us. And that's when money talks, unfortunately. Once you get them here, yeah, they'll love it, but you got to get them here in the first place. And for director's jobs, that's a tough nut to crack unless you're willing to spend some money. Well, it's also about today we have a lot of uh, two, two family members earning an income. So you're not only recruiting somebody for a key position, but you're probably also looking for that second job for that second person in that family. Because today, so many of our families have mom and dad both employed in careers and in jobs. So it's, um, it's easy to say it's all about money, and it is about money, but it's about a lot of other issues that we've got to make sure we have here. Very good. Tina, you're on. Okay. So, so we'll move in now to a discussion about um, revenue and expenses and ways to increase revenue or perhaps decrease expenses. Um, the revenues that we'll go over include sales tax, departmental service fees, property tax, and other revenue. So we know that six per six and a quarter percent of our sales tax goes to the state, one percent to the city, half a percent to the development corporation, and a half a percent to the county. Um, year to date, sales tax collections were over the prior year by three percent, and we're over our revenue budget by six hundred seventy-seven thousand dollars year to date. But what is the sales tax trend? Uh, it's been fairly positive this year. Uh, we did have one month, I think it was the month of December, that was negative 2.7%. However, that was largely due to audit adjustments in the previous December that kind of skewed that a little bit. If we if we pulled those out and extracted those um, adjustments, we would have been relatively flat for December. And I think this past month we were up 1%? 1 1.7%, yes. So we're not seeing the same increases that we saw a year ago. Yes, ma'am, that's correct. Um, here's our sales tax chart just showing um, that we have been, we have exceeded our revenue budget over the last several years. Um, and you'll also see that trend where we've budgeted the 5% de decrease. If you go from the green line to the next blue line, it kind of shows that trend where we've but that's been very budget. conservative it's with not, our budgeting. Yeah, it's over budget. It's not over LY. Is you can see saying? the trend where it's increased. I know, I'm though, just saying original year budget. Year over year. And actual. So if you, you talk about the percent increase, what's the actual percent increase versus what is the budget number? The percent. You pay for dollars, not percentages. So the dollar receipts is most important as a trend line versus necessarily. Right. I don't have the dollar amounts, but this trend line, oops, sorry, I'm bad at that. You can see where it's going, increasing year over year. It's, based on it's growing percentages. based on dollars. Right, that's what I said. The actual amount received is increasing. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So, um, next up is departmental service fees. Um, in fiscal year 2020, council directed staff to move to cost of service for all fees. In other words, 100% of cost of service. Um, FY 21 through 23, we froze that due to the COVID-19. Um, and then in FY 24, we did finally um, implement the second round of fee increases. Um, so that's in our budget for the current fiscal year. And then, uh, of course, in FY 2025, we plan to continue that next round of um, fee increases for those departments that are on our list for this year. Of course, Tina, the goal is to make sure that we get to 100% on all the fees that we provide. Uh, and that's one thing that's important to point out is we don't look at a, a profitable amount. We just want to break even for the services that we provide. And that's, yes, and that is based on services provided. Like you said, there are some um, expenditures, obviously, that would not be covered by a fee. And so 
um, those are absorbed. Um, but the, but for the services that we do provide, we do look at those every year, and we do plan to implement that next round of fees this coming fiscal year. Yeah. You know, I, uh, there was a big article yesterday or the day before uh, in Dallas, not that Dallas is San Angelo, but one of the key issues that is being debated there is um, the cost of fees relative to if your focus is, in fact, to provide affordable housing. and fees as a percentage or the part of what goes into the cost of building a home, they're relooking at that issue because they know that if we continue to raise fees, it continues to raise the median or the uh, dollar value of a home, which means you're getting further and further away from building a home at the affordable level that your workforce can digest meaning that if you have a million dollar home, the cost of the fee is minor compared to the building that home. But if you're building a $250,000 home, what's the percent those fees represent? And is, are the fees relative to the mission of building and having available for the workforce, because we talk about wanting people to come here and live here and work for us, why do we have available for them in housing? And so the fee thing becomes, you know, even a Dallas area is becoming a big issue in terms of what they will do or finally decide to do in terms of raising their fees as it relates to affordable housing. It's relevant. It is relevant, Mayor. I think the, the concern that I have with that, though, is there is a cost for provide, providing a service. And if we're not covering the cost for providing the service, my big concern is having a supplement from the general fund to cover the remainder of that. And I know, I know what you're saying because we do want to have affordable housing, but we also want to make sure that whatever that fee is, is something that is applied. And again, on our end, I know the planning department years back started working on those efficiencies to reduce the number of days it takes to do their inspections and everything else, and they've done a good job in that area. And it's imperative for us to make sure that we are being as efficient as possible to make sure that those fees actually don't go up uh, incrementally, though. But I just, just wanted to make sure I pointed that out as well. Set the rates that apply. Um, so, certified net taxable value in FY23 was $6.6 billion, increased to $7.6 billion in 2024. The value of a penny is $637,000 last year. This year, it's $732,000. And the tax rate, of course, as you know, has decreased over the last two years, um, approximately um, almost eight cents. Um, and, and the loss in general fund revenue due to that state cap of 3.5% has equated to about $2.4 million per year to the general fund for a total of about $4.9 million of loss of revenue to the general fund because of the state legislature. Explain that further. What? Okay. The state enacted le uh, a legislation that capped general fund property tax revenues at 3.5% increase year over year. And so with that, it forces down the property tax rate that the city is allowed to enact, which without an election, correct, which equates to $2.4 million per year over the, for the last two years. So you're talking about existing, not new. So the key to growing the property tax is new, not existing, because the 3.5 percent is relative to existing property, correct? That's correct, not yes. the total. Yes. So I would say, yes, the key is new properties as well as trying to impact state legislators um, to release that cap on our property tax revenue. But we're going to have to approve budgets before the state legislators meet Correct. again. Correct. In the short so, term, we have to find solutions. Yes, so ma'am. We have to keep focused on the next year where right now the 3.5 percent is the number that we are dealing with. Yes, ma'am. So if you take a look at the property tax rate, 
talk through the dollar, I mean, the percentage that we've decreased or the amount we have decreased the tax rate and go back over that number that shows the <coughs> difference in terms of what would have been the receipts if the tax rate had maintained versus what the actual receipts are. So our general fund budget could have increased by $4.9 million um, in excess of what it is today, which could have funded other council priorities that we were um, not allowed to enact. And when we talk about property tax, what's important about that comment is that our property tax dollars are the key. So today, our entire dollar amount of property tax dollars, the entire amount, let's say it's 48 uh, million, billion, a million dollars, 48 million dollars, let's use that as a base. Of that, we then take 5 million out of the sales tax dollars to add to that. So your 48 plus 5 is 53, plus a 2.4 we've added with the compensation that we've approved. So that total number is what? That right now funds property, the property tax plus sales tax that funds public safety. There's a lot of public in there. Do you have the actual numbers for these? So proper, sorry, property tax revenue in the general fund is $43.4 million coming in as revenue. The expenditures, did you ask for the expenditures for public safety? Well, what I, well, yes, 53 I, want you to, million. I want you to take the property tax dollars in our 23 projected numbers, if you will, mm -hmm. in terms of property tax dollars, plus the dollar amount that's going to come out of sales tax to help fund the deficit there. Okay, gotcha. Plus the dollar amount we've just approved for additional public safety salaries that was in the, was in the, um, Okay, so so we need to see what that total yes, number is right the, now because that 2.4 was not in the base correct. approved for the budget. It's, it's out in, there. It is included in this slide that we're presenting right now. Yes, ma'am. Go through that. Because so the property tax dollars coming in is 43.4 million dollars as revenue. Um, the expenditures for public safety are 53.3 million, including the 2.4 million. That's just police and fire. Um, so you are using $10 million of sales tax revenue to fund public safety. Is that what you're asking? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And of the uh, sales tax dollars projected for 23-24 budget, mm -hmm. what are the sales tax projections for that budget? So we budgeted $23.1 million, and of that you're using $10 million to fund public so safety. So you only have a balance of 13. Correct. Right? Yes, ma'am. And that conversation that we had for police and fire was a beginning conversation. It's not the final conversation in terms of the need. And so you're already taking a look at dipping into and taking a significant part of the sales tax dollars to help pay for public safety. That's correct. Yes. And yet those, those dollars are not adequate in conversation with what we need to do. That is correct, Mayor. I mean, we need to really plan for that, yeah. So that conversation means that we have to find a way to find the revenue to continue to fund public safety where we aren't mm -hmm. dipping $10 million into the sales tax number. Mayor, that's imperative, and thank you for pointing that out. And that is one of the bigger challenges that we do face. Uh, and I do want to emphasize that I know that the legis legis text legislation, I know that the, their intention, the intended purpose, was, of course, was to reduce property tax revenues overall. And I applaud them for that effort. But I also know that that I we feel very handicapped that we have that, li it is a limitation, it's three and a half percent. And unless you take that to the voters, it stays at three and a half percent. Well, the city, any city at the, at the very least with its municipal cost index, and that's the inflationary rate for any city, is going to go up easily above four percent every year. Um, and that's because of the cost of petroleum products go up, the heavy equipment that we purchased, pr pretty much everything we buy right now is very expensive. It's definitely not a 4% increase as y'all have seen in some of the decisions you've made and, and items you've approved. 
So we're moving up as far as our costs and our expenditures by more than 4%, sometimes a 5 or 6%, but yet we're being limited to 3.5% uh, by uh, that, that decision made by the state legislators. So it is a challenge, Mayor. Absolutely. It's something that's going to have to be looked at, and how do we combat that, and how, would it come up, how do we come up with a solution to really make sure that we're compensating at a level? And you mentioned public safety. Yeah, that's going to be an issue coming up this year as well that needs to be addressed. Well, and, and to further this conversation, it goes this way. So if you take a look at it and you say the following, because we're capped at the 3.5% on existing, in larger cities and cities surrounding us here, they have a much larger growth in economic development as it relates to commercial and industrial development. In San Angelo, Texas, uh, Tina, what percent is the residential property tax to our total? That's right there, man. And so what we see is we continue to have greater growth in our property tax dollars, not only in new, but existing on residential. And the key to residential development, which is what we have as the largest percentage compared to our surrounding communities, is when they buy a new home, they buy curtains, they buy draperies, they buy furniture, all of which drives the sales tax line. We wish we keep working towards more commercial development, new commercial development, to help fund the needs of this city. But the growth continues to be, dollar-wise, in residential. And that residential continues to drive the sales tax. We've got to keep that as a key focus here. Residential is property tax in this city. What's the residential dollar amount in the property tax versus commercial and industrial? Kimberly's going to look that up, but you can see that the percentage of residential versus commercial and industrial is growing exactly. at 1% per year. So Even though we want and we've focused on trying to, to grow the commercial industrial aspect, the reality is the following. It's residential. It That's our growth. And we've got to keep that in focus as we look at what we do to help support the residential development in this city because that is our growth. We're going to keep talking about economic development and the importance of commercial and industrial, but the reality is the following. Residential is growing. So the residential base is about $5.7 billion of our total valuation, and commercial is about $2 billion of yeah. our total valuation. So that has to be a focus, and we have to understand the importance of that residential because... Commercial doesn't happen overnight. Finding that commercial development, that industrial development project to add to our, our base is hard to find. And the base is so large for residential, it's going to take a lot to uptick that number. Good point. Continue. Okay, so if there's no more discussion on revenues, uh, we'll move on to expenditures. Well, let's talk, well, we talked, I mean, we've talked about public safety. We've talked about um, uh, what are the other issues as it related to sales tax dollars, because that's, there's that $10 million that we have there that has to cover everything else out of the general fund, right? Yes, so ma'am. We'll talk about those. Obviously, economic development is one of the ways to impact uh, sales tax revenue. Uh, the only other way that we have that we can control would be to be less conservative on budgeting for sales tax. Instead of um, budgeting for a 5% decrease from the current year, we could kick that up to a 3% decrease from the current year. That would provide additional sustainable revenue to the general fund to fund other council priorities. Um, other than that, again, economic development is the key factor. That and, uh, of course, the meeting merit for the DMO, anything that tourism does to bring people to our community, you can increase the sales tax revenues in that, in that way, also heads and beds and what have you, but really that has a pretty good impact on sales tax revenue. So it's, not, so it's not only tied to the residents of our community, but also visitors to our community as well. 
And that means that we've got to make sure the streets are in good working order. That's right. Because people evaluate your city and whether they want to come here, live here, or visit here mm -hmm. is based off of our streets. That's a key part. But then it's the amenities. Do they come here because the river stage is a great outdoor facility? Do they come here because we have splash pads? Probably not, because that's really residential. It's not tourism. But we've got to make sure we look at the things that bring people here to spend their money. If 51% of the sales tax revenue is from outside our city, so 49% 49 49 is with citizens spending money here. 51% is people coming into the city. Now, remember, that could be people coming in from Cristoval, from Mertzen, from Eden, from et cetera. So that's outside our city limits, if you will. So we've got to make sure the things that people enjoy here are funded. Absolutely. That's key. So Brenda and Daniel, let me ask y'all a question. Do we, and this may go back to Tina and Kimberly also, um, from some of that travels a lot, we have business travelers that come here quite often. Are we charging what we're allowed to charge on hotel receipts for income and fees and things like that? Because I will look at certain cities and the number of fees and things that get charged to a business person traveling is considerably greater than what we have. And I don't know what those are. And, you know, I apologize for not knowing the maximum things you can charge. But, I mean, to people that travel on a business, the majority of them are expensing that back to their business. It's a cost. And if that, if you were able to take the number of business travelers that come through San Angelo and add, you know, two to three to four dollars per stay per person, I mean, that, that generates revenue. We have to look at things we can focus. I don't even know if we maximize that or try to at all. I have no idea. Uh, so the 13 percent is the state regulated hotel occupancy tax. Um, but you can charge an additional, I think it's two percent. Um, but I think it has to be project related and it's called a, I think it's called a venue tax. It is, is that a, right, Teresa? It, it is a venue tax. Yeah. Yeah. And the question is that venue tax, what can that spend, what can you spend that money on? Because when we talk about the things that we have that can be revenue generators um, are things like the river stage, just as an example. But if you look at those hot tax monies, are those hot tax monies available for venues like the River Stage to continually improve those facilities? Yes, the the hot tax dollars are available for that type of um, improvement. Um, I think, no, Teresa. One, they are, but one thing <laughs> but the venue out, tax specifically to has to be related to a specific project. The additional two percent, a specific project with a specific debt issuance related to it. It also has to be voted on by the citizens. That's correct. Yeah, or, to that's key. The venue tax, you have to. Well, it, it's fine, which but you I, can. But those are things you can do. But those well, are the processes to get. It. Well, so if we get to throw something on the paper, I say we need to implement a venue tax. Whether we dedicate it to the river stage, the Coliseum, a park, a splash pad, we but, need to designate yeah. that just to pursue it. I and mean, we can't leave two percent on the table if we can get it. The McNeese Center as well. I mean, hey, yes. we need more breakout rooms. We need a bigger facility. Absolutely. We have a lot of needs, and so, you know, as we talk through this. Um, and we talk about economic development and the things that we need to spend money on to keep driving the revenues, we need a much further in-depth conversation about what those are and what we could expect from them because we need to drive revenue. Well, we but need I, I, and I, I didn't mean to interrupt, Brenda, no, but, I, but I think the, the point of that is that's something that our citizens do not bear. It's paid by the business traveler, the majority of the expense it, and it's a way to you know, cre create some revenue. If we're going to focus on it, that's somewhere we need to go. And uh, to add to that, Tom, it also takes the onus off of the uh, residential property taxpayer, the people that spend money here locally. If our, if again, our sales tax revenues go up, that actually eases up on those property tax rates as well. So that's a good point. To Tina's point a minute ago, I think then it would be wise for us to seriously consider going to 3%. Um, as the conservative number as opposed to five to get that additional revenue in in the budget that we obviously do need now. So I, I, I would encourage y'all to, to look at that too. 
Well, and I think that we, as we, and again, we're so early on on this product, on this conversation. Yeah. We're five months ahead of when we typically sit down here and have this conversation. So the question mark is trend line. Um, the economy, it's a presidential election year, which generally the economy uh, is a tough economy during a presidential election year. So we want to be realistic in that sales projection, whether it's 5%, 3%, or flat. Um, we want to make sure uh, we have a, a, a realistic budget that we can, cause can execute. One of the greatest uh, budgeting concepts that we have had over the past few years is the conservative budget. And that means that we've had money and the uh, available to do things like we just did, 2.4 million in um, available as a lump sum to spend on public safety because we've planned conservative and those dollars have gone into, what's it called? The fun, our fund balance. Or fund balance, mm -hmm. because it's in the fund balance because we planned conservatively, we had a chunk of money. Mm -hmm. The more you plan, I want to say real, if it's realistic, if that's what we're saying, when you have issues that come up, that chunk of money's not there. Yeah. And so you also want to make sure that you're not um, hurting yourself by not having the ability to accumulate sums of money. And that's a good point, Mayor, but I would remind Council that that is a one-time funding source that is not sustainable, and so therefore that will come out of marginal revenue going into the next budget that's cycle. That's the reason I said when we take a look at sales tax revenue, you're already $7.5 million out of sales tax revenue to help fund public safety. So, again, it was there. We're lucky right. we had it because I'm not sure how we would have addressed the issue that needed to be addressed for public safety as it related to salaries. But that has that won't go away, and that 2.4 is spent now. And I think that goes back to Tommy's point that if we push on sales tax a little harder, that will help shore up some of that shortage going into the next fiscal year. Uh, I do want to point out, though, the responsibility, fiscal responsibility that this council has had in administration as well is that for the longest time for the city of San Angelo, the days in fund balance was around 75 days. Ideal number would be 90 days in fund balance. We currently sit at 104 days of fund and found balance. That's pretty... Is that's that a, with the 2.4 taken out? Yes, ma'am. That's, that's uh, the, that, to where at the 104 at this point. So, again, that just goes to, to, to show just how responsible uh, the city council, city administration has been in managing our, our budget in a very conservative manner. It's been a good strategy, and it has worked for but us. The because, sandbag has been yes. helpful. At the end of the year, the sandbag has been helpful. It's paid for a lot of projects. Right, it has, but, I, you know, there's, there's a point where we may have to... Yes, rethink it. Rethink it, so... Okay, so moving on, unless there's other comments, questions, statements to be made. Okay, move on to development services fees. So next we'll talk about expenses, which includes service levels, staffing, staffing and operational efficiencies. Um, here's your uh, chart that shows all funds with the expense by type, including personnel, O&M, capital, and transfers out. Talk about, when we talk about um, property tax dollars and we talk about O&M, et cetera, explain, better explain that to everyone in terms of O&M versus the other statistics. So this is all funds. This is not just general fund, but um, in all funds, there are personnel, O&M, capital and transfers out type expenses. Um, personnel is pretty self-explanatory, but O&M is related to things like maintenance, utilities, those ongoing contract um, professional services, those ongoing types of expenditures that departments need to operate. Um, capital is usually related to smaller capital items or technology, um, like laptops, computers, things like that. And then transfers out is usually related to indirect costs and or transfers to a debt service fund or some other related fund to support that, um, th that fund's expenditures. So general fund expenses um, include police, fire, general government, other departments, public works, and public service. And you can see those dollar amounts related to each there on the slide.
So the big question right now, is that rain? Are we hearing rain outside? I was going to ask. Is it? We don't hear it that often, so if anybody's here. It's take a moment. A moment of silence. I, what? Yeah. I'm somebody trying to tell us, I'm checking right now, Mary. I'm trying to figure out. Will somebody run outside real quick? <laughs> 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 if you come back wet, it's raining. Chief Brody, can you go look for rain since you're in the water department? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's done. Oh, right quick. Quick. Hush, hush, Rick. They think they call that a shower. Is that exactly. It? <laughs> so the main purpose of this slide is just to show what, you know, services the, the city provides that are funded by the general fund. Um, and so in order to impact expenses, we'd have to look at decreasing, you know, any expenditures that we currently provide for services. Um, so just showing, you know, where those areas are. And then... Go back to that one. That's too okay. fast. Okay. So other department is what? Uh, let's see. Do I have a list of that That's here? $12 million. What does that cover? Okay. So municipal court, planning and development services, neighborhood and family services, health, and then transfers out for um, supporting other funds such as Fort Concho Cemetery and um, Fort, uh, the sports complex. And so public works is... Uh, let me see. Street and bridge. Let me see here. Traffic, operations, um, street lighting, engineering. Water's in a separate, separate fund. fund. Oh, thank you, Kimberly. And then, let's see, public service includes parks, the water lily garden recreation, and the swimming pool. So when we start talking about um, fees, et cetera, we'll want to take a look at the red ink, black ink story on some of those things. Yes, ma'am. That's correct, ma'am. So I got a question here. I'm, Ask if, a if question. We look, if we look at this mix, Brenda, Tina, yes. is this similar to other cities? I mean, is the ratio, if, if this was a pie chart, is our dedication to public safety, and if we look at every little piece of this, is the ratios that we spend very similar to other to other cities. And you know, this is not a today answer. It's just something I'd be curious about. In the future, if suddenly we look in, what we spend in public works mm -hmm. is 15% more than what other people spend. Right. It'd be something it'd be great right. to look at just to see if we sit within the trend of cities that are doing it right. That's a great question. And in the last several years, we've gotten away from using comp cities as a basis for, you know, Looking at our well, service we like levels, to look away et cetera. From them when it's not in our favor, but anyway, right. Long well, we only way. have what we have. So. Exactly. But, but Daniel does have um, an item on the agenda later in the conversation to talk about comp cities and whether we should include those in our in our research. But we can definitely bring that back at another meeting. Well, the one that flew up right here, and it's going to throw in probably Shane or Patrick here in a minute. There was some things that the state has kicked back to the city as far as maintenance that we mandates. As, Unfunded mandate. Street signs. Yeah. There's some things, certain places that we learn that, oh, by the way, they don't do this, and all mm -hmm. the way now that they're making us take care of these certain specific right of ways that are state right of way. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there are things that we've had to assume and take over the past six, seven years. To me, that was like they didn't even tell us. So, on top of capping our property exactly. tax revenue. Exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. just a list of things that tick us off, but long yeah. story short, those things fall into that category. and. I don't know if there's a way to defend those or fight back and say, no, that's always been in your sandbox. You keep it there. So I, that's something we can discuss later. But we, we do have to assume those costs as they come. Absolutely. Well, and we all, you know, as we do comps and evaluate what we do versus other cities, we also have to take a look at what their revenues are. It's one thing as a percentage, but yeah, what yes. were their sales tax increases? Yes. What percent is their commercial and industrial to the residential? Right. One of the reasons we have the high property tax rate that we have, although we have decreased it based off of the mandate, we have a much higher property tax rate than cities around us because their commercial industrial piece of their property tax dollars is a significant amount. And we'll, we've we've done better in that, in that uh, as a matter of fact, even Abilene finally caught up, and we started actually getting a little bit lower as well. So we've held our property tax rate for the longest time without an increase in it, Mayor, for at least over a decade. 
Um, so that's been a challenge in itself to make sure we stay within that, but then now to have not just that, but reduce it to three and a half below mm -hmm. that, uh, the, the previous numbers, which um, kind of hurts really. Yeah, and we actually have a slide later on in the presentation yeah. to discuss, you know, why we use comparable cities and what kind of bases we should use mm -hmm. to determine what those comp cities are. So we'll talk about that in a little bit, too. Yeah, it's only as good as we have the money yeah. and as we have um, the debt, our debt versus other cities' debt. And um, we know that other cities have gone out for some major bond elections over the past year. So that becomes uh, an issue as well. How much debt are you willing to take on to fund whatever those issues are, mm -hmm. those priorities? Yes, okay, if we're ready to move on, we'll um, kick it over to Brian Kendrick, Director of HR, to discuss staffing levels and um, ways we can improve there. And, and I really, sorry. Um, Brian Kendrick, Director of HR. Um, I really just want to see what what do y'all want to talk about, so I'm here to really answer any questions. Uh, I mean, I can certainly speak as long as you want me to, but uh, I really want to be here to answer your questions as it relates to uh, the priorities. Well, what I think we need to, to do is really look at the holistic um, picture of compensation. We keep trying to do things to improve the compensation, and I want to make sure that the things that we have approved over the past few years are inclusive and part of a pay schedule, meaning the following. Regardless of where the money came from and regardless of whether we attached a dollar amount to it, there are things that we have tried to do to improve the personnel um, mindset of working for the city of San Angelo. For example, this last budget session, we added two more days of vacation. Those are nice things, but what's the dollar value attached to that that's part of the compensation? Because we've done those things in lieu of, let's say, a higher pay increase. Mm -hmm. But what are they worth? The same thing on um, the pay of um, longevity. We've increased or we created a longevity program. What are those worth? Because the question mark is, and the same thing we gave, um, correct me if I'm wrong, a seven point something percent increase two years ago. Two years ago? 7%, uh, yes, okay. two years ago. But then we gave $2,500 stipend. So that, although that cash was a part of the ARPA money, it was not part of the sales tax income line. But that gave, you know, if you take that uh, $2,500 for every employee times the number of employees we have, that dollar value was what? Um, you don't have to answer right, it. It's just, right. I'm just no, putting it out there. And, so, and, I, and I think these are all really good points. So, so you've got to use that as we did compensate higher than 7.3%. Is it in the base? No. But it is cash. It's money. And I want us to be able to utilize those things that we have done to improve the morale of our, of our employees. But they do cost money and they were done to improve the morale of our employees. Did we do that? Was it perceived to be that? Is, was it a negative because it wasn't in the base pay versus no. a check? And so all of that has to be taken into consideration in terms of a pay package. What are we doing and what's worth more? Those two extra vacation days? How did that feel? Was that a good morale thing that we did? Was the longevity pay a good morale thing? Does it solve the issue? No, absolutely not. But what's okay. <coughs> worth more? So, um, I mean, I think those are all great points. And, I mean, when you talk about a compensation package, uh, you're talking about benefits, you're talking about, you know, all, all the whole package is not just right. the salary. And so... Uh, as far as from a human resources perspective, and I don't want to get too scattershot here, yeah. but 
Uh, you know, some people hear human resources and they don't really know really what, what that means. So the heart of what we do, uh, the goal of that is to have the right people in the right places to provide service, uh, efficient services to our community. That's what human resources does in government. And the second component of that is if you have the right people in the right positions, uh, then they are creative about how you uh, how you save money, how you build in efficiencies, how you um, how you uh, maybe expand revenue opportunities, and so having those people. So that's that's the goal of everything we do, and of course, the compensation package is how we try to do that. Well, and, and I'm glad you bring all that up because one of the other key things that we've done, I'm not sure all cities do it, but health care is a major issue. It's a major expense, and we have as a council chosen to pay for all those increases when they've happened in terms of the cost of um, medical care. Yes, so um, we, we can talk through as much or as little of the, the benefits situation. Really, what I want to kind of talk about is where we've been and, and, and kind of what we've seen, especially as it relates to, um, to loyalty pay, what you mentioned, and um, the siphons. Loyalty sounds so much better than longevity, doesn't <laughs> it? And I think I called it longevity. That doesn't <laughs> no, sound right. Loyalty it's, pay. It's, it's, it's perfectly fine. I, everybody does that. So uh, loyalty, loyalty pay that you mentioned and the stipend. So one of the things that we, we looked at um, really when, when I took over leadership of HR was, you know, wh what are we doing at the bottom end? How do we disproportionately affect that? Um, but then, of course, we faced COVID, and um, our vacancy rate, you know, went up. And I think right at the end of COVID, we had, and, and I want to kind of walk through all that because I don't know if everybody is really clear about what we did. And again, it's it, it this attests to our conservative nature in the leadership of um, of our city government. A, a week or two before we had our first positive COVID test in San Angelo. How long ago does that seem um, that was? Oh my gosh, yeah. forever ago yeah. now. Or yesterday, yeah. depending on how you look at it. Um, two weeks before that, I, I went to Daniel and said, I think it's time for us to uh, have a hiring freeze. Um, and I, I still think, because if I knew... If I knew now maybe what I knew then, maybe we wouldn't have done it quite that way. But knowing what I knew, the information that was in front of me, uh, I was trying, again, to be conservative. We didn't know what we were facing. Uh, we had heard all of the stuff that was coming from, like, Italy and New York. And, and so we were trying to be conservative, and, and I, I think that's good. Uh, when we came out of that, I think you'll remember when we had that budget, uh, the budget workshop that year, I think it was 2020, uh, when we came out of the hiring freeze in August, um, I think we were having a budget hearing, and I said, you know, our, our vacancy rate's at 10%. We've had the hiring freeze. I just don't know how those things are going to work out. We haven't been off the hiring freeze for a long time, which I think we discussed. And so we kind of, it was just a warning that we're starting to see that. Um, over the next year, if you'll remember, by the August of the next year, I came to you and said 18% was our vacancy rate, which is sort of terrifying. Um, and the things that we did over those two years, the loyalty pay addition, and it not only did that disproportionately affect the bottom end, which was good, but it also is significant toward retention and stemming the flow of, of losing folks. Mm -hmm. So when we're facing that sort of a deficit as a vacancy rate, mm -hmm. um, retaining who we have is very important because we need to build on it and not lose some of what we already have. So that, that was significant, and, I, and, and we have heard nothing but positive okay. feedback on the loyalty pay program. That, that, that's money well spent. Um, the, the ARPA money as well, the stipends, again, those were retention efforts. You know, they were, they were spread out during the course of that year to make sure people would st stay to that next date to receive that. So, again, um, where I can point to that worked, not only did I hear anecdotally positive things about those things, um, where it has worked is we've seen that uh, vacancy rate, it was 18.39 when I first uh, came to y'all, uh, or when I, when I really sounded the alarm, in August of 22, I think it was, 
gosh, it's hard to remember mm -hmm. exactly how this all goes. Uh, October of 22, it had shrunk to 16.75. That was uh, loyalty. I mean, that loyalty had a significant point part of that. Again, uh, January of the following year, it was 15.86. April, uh, we saw it move to 14.71. And all that to say, now we've seen that to move. It's just right over, it's like 12.2%. That's still, like Daniel said, still scary. Um, but we have seen progress in that. And, and, and we can't discount the fact that part of that is those efforts related to loyalty pay and to the, the stipend. Uh, of course, that's, that stipend's over now, and so that's not going to have retention, you know, going forward. But I think it did help us during a, a really tenuous time um, in, in our history. So all that be, to be in say, uh, said, of that 12.2% overall, that includes seasonal and, and part-time, um, I really wanted to kind of dig down, and, and it's 11.36%. I don't know that I've necessarily given you all that number. That's a full-time employees. Um, so it's not and, lifeguards in that whole. World. It's not. That's that's just full-time employees. And my my fear in that number is just to kind of get into like an engineering sort of idea. You know that if you know for anything, no matter how well it's built, this organization I think is a very good organization. But no, how, no matter how well something's built, the longer that there's stress on it, the more chances there are of a failure. Um, and that, that's my concern is we still have eight full-timers trying to do nine full-timers jobs. Um, and, and I won't discount the, the point that Karen made about leader, you know, we have disproportionately affected the lower end and now we're starting to see really vacancy rates at, at higher end positions, which is also, uh, you know, I, I know we're asking a very, a huge amount from Shane as he's trying to run water utilities without the water utilities director or either one of the two assistant directors in that in that thing. So those are some of the challenges that we have overall. But, but to answer the question, those things were important and uh, I think they did help us kind of make progress through that. Um, but there's still progress that needs to be made. Um, so I want to just, uh, because we are talking about leadership right now, I, I want to make sure that what we do do is um, talk about the way Rick and Michael Dane have stepped up um, in their leadership role and the areas that they oversee to compensate for uh, some of the vacancies. Yes, that's a, that's a good point, too. It's, we, the strength of of those two individuals and the roles that they have have made a big difference in terms of our not feeling the pinch of the pinch of or the holes that exist. The other thing that I think you see very often when you have some of leadership roles become available and you have a Rick or a Michael take on those positions is you start to see what is really needed because you're more engaged, you're more involved, you're hands-on, and you see things differently than you do when your steps down in terms of, of people there. They've helped fill those holes. I'm not saying they need to do that long-term, but I do want to make sure that everyone understands that their position, their leadership in those roles have provided to make sure that we don't have any hiccups along the way in terms of decisions that we're making, uh, progress that we're making, they have stepped up and filled those holes. I, they I, haven't left people, same thing with Shane. He's made sure that the strength is there. And the other great thing that the city has done is that, and Shane will say this, I think, is that by the nature that we've had some engineer, engineer positions available, Engineers very often have a very specific function in terms of what they look at. The fact that we've been able to find qualified consultants, if you want to call them that, or agents that are very specific in terms of what they do to fill the holes for engineers. We can't even begin to hire enough engineers to take care of the workload that's out there right now because of all the infrastructure projects that we have. We have a lot of in infrastructure projects, mm -hmm. water, streets, etc. 
So we found a way to ensure that we're not limiting and stopping the work that needs to be done. That doesn't mean we don't need to fill those leadership right. roles, but I want to give credit to those individuals that have made sure the work mm -hmm. continued to happen right. in a very professional way. And, and I think that's true. That's a, that's a good point. Um, uh, it kind of does sort of give us a focus on that, that idea of we have eight people doing nine people's jobs. And so what I would imagine is there are days that Michael or Rick leave or Shane leave on a Friday and they go, boy, I hope something didn't fall through the cracks exactly. this week because they're just, uh, it, it's a lot of stress. Um, and, uh, you know, again, the longer there is stress in, in anything, the more chance there is going to be of a failure. I know, um, you know, all the regulations, all the things that we deal with, whether it's financial regulations, TCEQ, benefits, human resources, those kind of things, um, they, they've gotten some of the time where Veronica and I leave on a Friday and go, what do we miss? <laughs> you know, I just, I, I hope we're, we're getting everything that's being thrown at us. Well, I do want to say, Mayor, that with Rick, things definitely did fall through the cracks. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> <laughs> Rick, it's your fault again. You messed up. It's been good. I've seen sweat for a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's really as a result of, of the staff that we have working. That's you have great. a ton of committed staff, and I'm fortunate to work with a bunch of those, and that's the reason. But I think, Brian, is it is a good point. You can only go so long without filling those because then things do start, eventually it starts snowballing. But we're blessed with and wonderful, committed people who actually make that happen, not me. And, Mayor, thank you for pointing that out. That's yeah, important they, because they, 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 they really have gov gone above and beyond. So thank you for pointing that out. Some of those positions, too, were they filled by the work that they would be able to do and things they would be able to catch would more than pay for their salaries. I think that that, that is true. Um, One other here. thing I wanted to add <clears throat> in terms of a, mm -hmm. an entire compensation package is that those are discussions that we have internally um, with Daniel and obviously in our office um, when we know that, you know, funds are limited. And so um, as part of a you know, something that's presented in the future to council, those, those might be part of that. Um, we are researching all the time to see what um, can keep us competitive aside from salary and what's out there that uh, would be uh, an appeal to bringing people in. Well, and I think part of that, and it came up, I believe, at the last city council meeting, it might have been the one before that, is automation. And that we've got to make sure that part of the funding that we do pays for the upgrades that staff needs to keep current. And if we don't fund those things, particularly in the planning department, if you will, if we're not funding those upgrades that they need so we can reduce the workload on staff because the efficiency of automation that exists today. So we want to make sure in the budget process that those issues are funded and, and to take that pressure and the workload off of people. We keep talking about all the things in the planning department that are now done online, that are now uh, approved online. Well, that should reduce the amount of work or no, number of people that we need. Is that happening? And uh, you don't have to, I'm just right. making the statement. Don't, so, I'm yeah, not So there, there is a downward, I think there's a downward um, impact on, on, you know, how much is, is needed from manual, you know, entries or whatever from automating processes. Um, but there's always an upward thing on, you know, <laughs> the regulations that we find ourselves in, too. So it, we're always just combating all of that. But, yes, I think it's important that we look at our staffing levels really every year uh, and just kind of... Well, determine. we want to make sure we don't postpone for two years a, pro a program that planning really needs or somebody right. really needs to make their work successful. Absolutely. Correct. Now, and sometimes those programs actually allow us time. It doesn't necessarily mean we won't need the positions because our caseloads have gone up, those kind of things. The other thing it does typically is provide more efficiency in the turnaround time. So if it's having to go to 14 million different departments, it allows that to happen without one staff person hand walking it around. Now it's going and you can see it online. So it allows the permit to be issued quicker. We just want to make sure we're investing in the infrastructure within the organization that's not streets and water, but the infrastructure needed in the offices to efficiently do the work. 
yeah, upgrades, whatever they are, new programs, whatever they are. We need that investment made. That's part of, I hate to say it, but part of infrastructure. It's just internal, not external. And, and then to touch, uh, I think you mentioned insurance and, and you know, just to make sure we're, everybody's clear on this city does spend a significant amount on, on insurance. The, the, the problem in, inside of that is, of course, we have, uh, we have a population that we cover that a, a lot of other cities are not covering, which is retirees prior to, you know, that were hired prior to uh, a certain year to 2000. And we're happy to do that. That was a good benefit back then. That was probably good for retention and all those things. So I'm not, I'm not bashing that, but that is part of that ex overall expense. So what we find is because we're subsidizing that, uh, the money that we spend um, is, you know, some of it's going toward that so that our health benefit that we're actually offering employees is probably a little bit below average from what we hear from uh, Holmes Murphy. So. Um, you know, it is, it's good to have a health plan, but, you know, obviously we're carrying an, an additional burden inside of that. And I think the city is putting, you know, a, an appropriate amount of money toward it, but, you know, we're trying to balance all that as well. So that's, that's also a struggle in, you know, when it comes to that. But it is expense. all part of the, the package, but it all has to be looked at. Right. It all yeah. has to be looked at. So, I mean, for instance, when we had the city engineer position open, um, the primary reason we, we lost uh, the city engineer candidate that we were trying to get way back, way back when, when we first uh, did the recruitment, the primary reason was the health insurance was so much, it, w it, was, it was lacking compared to what his current, uh, as an assistant city engineer somewhere else was. So. Uh, so yes, yeah, so that's part of the, I mean, everything is part of the package that we have to look at, but uh, I mean, we're needy people, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, let, let me ask, let me go down a different path. This just came into my brain. Even with strides that we've made in the last three years in our, in our uh, increases in compensation, how many, how many folks, either a percentage of the workforce or a number, uh, either one, how many of our folks still use SNAP? We, we used to call it food stamps. How, how, how many folks do we still have that we do that? We, we don't we track don't that. Track that. Uh, I mean, obviously, we have some that would be eligible um, for that, but I, we don't track that. Um. What we do track is uh, employees working additional jobs, and I can tell you that um, point. year after year, uh, I would... I would probably say, as far as a percentage, a good 10 to 15 percent of our employees are working. Have to work. Jobs. Have to work another job. Yeah, and I couldn't tell you if some of that is desire or need, um, but it, it definitely happens. But I sign off on every one of those, and I, I would tell you that's a great point because uh, what I've seen is <laughs> the first couple of years I didn't sign off on as nearly as many of those as I have the last three years. So. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, we, we have, again, we're, it's, it's just there's a lot of needs before us, and, and I certainly don't value the hard decisions that y'all have to make. Well, the uh, needs wanna... have also come because inflation has really hurt the household income oh, because yes. it's very hard yes, to keep up is... with what, the, not this year because we're down to 3.5 or 3.4 percent inflation now, but when you had the dramatic increase in um, food costs, et cetera, Inflation, it's hard to keep up with it, and everybody's suffered from the inflationary impact of um, food uh, as just one item, and there's multiple items within that. Mm. Mayor? Yes, ma'am. Mayor. Oh, yes, sir. Let's take a break. Yeah, uh, I've had that request over here, but what I was trying to do was just finish their conversation gotcha. okay. before we moved on and took a break. A so yes. that was all I was trying to do. I, I do have um, before me, uh, uh, I've taken a look at, of course, back in 2007, again, I try to give some history to this. Back in 2000, 2007, uh, City Council was looking at compensation and uh, they hired a group called Public Sector Consultants, uh, spent a significant amount of money for that survey. 
um, or, or that, that work that they did to, to look at our overall compensation plan. And one of the things they brought back was that sister cities. I think I've heard a little bit of discussion about that. I do have some information about that. We had 13 back then. Um, personally, I would recommend if, if, we're, if we were to go back to that or, or uh, you know, change that somewhat, whatever we want to do, um, I would say that we probably should add College Station to that list. They are very similar when it comes to uh, population, revenue, organizational structure of their city, their median income, it's a college town, their commutes are the same. I mean, they are very, very similar to us. Uh, and I know that that's what they were looking for in those other 13, but since then, College Station has become pretty I think you need to add a, I think you need to take away and then probably add because we've got to take Midland and Odessa out of there. They're, they're absolutely off the chart as it relates to compensation because the oil business dramatically changes every city. So I think you've got to take Midland, Odessa out of those 13 cities. I think you should add what you just said, but I think you could probably find another city like College Hills that might be a good comp city to look at. I, and that's up to you what those cities are, but two years ago, I think it was, you did this excellent um, analysis of cities that were 100,000 population cities. And I forget all the criteria that you use, but population was definitely one of them. We, we looked at from 50 to 150 in Texas, so we made it much more broad. The difficult is how long that takes uh, uh, our staff to, to complete Definitely. that sort of thing because we're looking at so many cities. But yes, um, it, it was very insightful, uh, the, the things that it told us. And then the other thing that I looked at that year was um, looking at those cities, their revenue per capita, so that we could have some way to gauge where we should be. Um, and you know what I found is, is actually not that much different from what we paid the consultants to tell us way back in 2008 uh, when they got done with that study, uh, which is that we, our, our at least initial goal needs to be 91, 92% competitive. Um, and so that's... Well, that yeah. analysis was, for me, one of the best analysis that I were done. That. And Thank again, you. we it's are nice data driven. Yeah. We are data driven, believe me. We that. are. And and again, half in, we must take Midland and Odessa out of there because they're the ones who check mark and totally change the statistics. We need other cities added. College Hills is a great one. You can go through that list of those cities, trying to focus mostly uh, on 100,000 population. And Mayor, we actually have um, a topic on the agenda where we're going to. Oh. Okay. Give some I'm ideas to council on what we should consider um, when we choose our comp cities and the ways in which we use, you know, that information to gauge how we're doing in comparison okay. with other cities too. So definitely that's something we'll talk about okay. for sure. Mary, but that analysis yeah. that you did that, I guess it was two years ago, yeah, yes, was really good. good. And I think, you know, whatever time it took, you know, I'm not big in hiring consultants to do studies, but that analysis that you did... Uh, was good, and the thought process was good. Thank you. I appreciate that. We worked hard at it. It was so. good, okay. and I think it, it was just really good. Okay. Um, is there any other questions? That well, I don't think so, because I think no. taking a break seems to be the priority <laughs> right now, so if that concludes, we're going to take a break right now, okay? okay. You have you. 12 minutes. Oh, yes. Well, uh, we've been talking about the uh, employees that are leaking, but we're also considering some increase in staffing positions, too. Do you have any rough numbers on what uh, what you're hearing from different departments about uh, personnel they're going to need to gain? Um, well, okay, so historically we've, we've struggled with that. I mean, again, we have so many needs, um, and it's kind of hard to talk about what we need... We do need to keep it in mind. It's hard to talk about what we need to add until we fill what we currently have. Um, and yes, I mean, there are, there are ones that, that need it. I mean, honestly, one of the things that I would say just before we go to break, if I can have just a few minutes. One it of the depends th on these kids in yeah, terms of whether they really can wait any Sorry. longer. <laughs> I, I can wait till after break. I, I can wait for my answer. Okay. But, uh, We're going to wait for that answer. We'll, be, we'll take it 12 minute break or something like that. 
Uh, before we move on, and I'm not even sure on this agenda where we're at, but before we move on, Brian, I'd like to just a couple of things that I'd like to add to that conversation. You can sit. You don't need to move. These are just, okay, come on up. One of the key focuses on economic development has been workforce development. And because we talk about the number of vacancies that we have, um, what I want to make sure we have the opportunity to do is to uh, connect with ASU and our school system as it relates to working for cities or government jobs within the city. Because what we have here are we have great people who've chosen to either do school here or work here or live here. How many of them are aware of our needs, a career path? How do we put out there a real positive, have you considered this as your career and your future? What opportunities are there? Because we can't wait for people to come to us, and we need to make sure we are aggressively going out there and saying, we got a job for you. We've got a place for you. Let us help you. Because it's all about outreach more than anything else. And, and like I said, I can talk as long as, as, long as you have. And so I know the time is precious, so I don't want to over say my welcome. But um, I'm going to ask Brian to come up and talk. We've seen in, in um, vacancy rate is based on, you know, we've kind of reshifted some of the uh, some of the things that we do in HR, and we have uh, Keisha who works in our office, and she is uh, very interactive in all those, you know, all those times, the opportunities that she gets to talk about, you know, when they have their work fairs and job fairs and those kind of things. She's always in contact with all those folks to be there to answer questions, to talk about the positions we have open. And so that that is one of the components of, you know, trying to drag down this this vacancy rate over time. I think career path is a big topic of conversation, and we know uh, nationwide government jobs are a large percentage of the total workforce, mm -hmm. and we're that, and we want to make sure career path, it's not just a job, mm -hmm. it's a career path, and it's a broad category of potential job categories, whether it's in MIS, whether it's in human resources, right. whether it's in engineering, um, I know... Uh, the, the best value you will ever get an employee is the one who's living here already. Yes, absolutely. And so that, that brings up a, a really good point. So one of the things that I've uh, driven as far as, as we've, as we've looked at our, stru at our, at our structure, at our pay, uh, titles and grades, uh, and you can talk to many directors where I've had this conversation, we really need career paths inside of these places. And so we've talked about, uh, and we've created several job families throughout the organization where you know, you start off as, 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 you know, maybe budget analyst, for example, uh, and then you can move to budget analyst two down the road. So you, you don't leave for something else. You actually grow. Then you become budget analyst three. Then maybe you have an opportunity to be budget manager, maybe assistant director. And so that's part of our organizational development and succession planning. We're, we're in the middle of that. Obviously, that, that is an area we have an opportunity. We have to do much, much more because you're right. What we can grow from inside is always going to be better than, and maybe not better, but it's always going to be more efficient than trying to recruit from the outside. And, Absolutely. And that's not knowing that history, that job history on, for that person. And so, our surrounding communities, point. because we have, you know, people like, there's something great about this community and living here, and, and, and we want to make sure people know they can grow here. You yes. don't have to leave. Yeah. And I want career paths, not jobs. Right. I'm not interested in jobs. Right. No. I'm interested in I'm career 100% paths. 100 with you. There are a couple of career fairs that we do already participate in at the high school level. Um, Keisha and, and some of our other staff are there. Um, you know, we get um, through ASU. They have their engineering program. They have a specific career fair for that as well, and we're we're at that also. So we do stay in touch within the community to see what's available where we can highlight those careers as well. That's key to me. It's 
the best value you will get in an employee is someone who's already embraced us. If it's free, we'll take two. So yeah, there you we're, go. we're always doing those kind of things, those opportunities. Uh, any low-hanging fruit, we're <laughs> we pick that pretty dry. Uh, so yeah, we're 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 definitely all about it. And the uh, I think you know more job families throughout the organization is probably better. Um, so so we're always looking at that where we have those opportunities and and you know we're not that way we're retaining folks long term because the job you know the first goal get somebody where they're here for five years because if they're here for five years they're vested in TMRS that means something Agreed. Uh, and then you know we get them a little bit further so everything that we try to structure whether it was the loyalty pay or anything anything we're trying to structure uh, we're trying to structure toward keeping people long term because. There's just a value in that. Uh, I mean, I can't tell you. I, I know I've told you a hundred times uh, in the past, but getting you know t- talking Veronica to come back to this organization with the uh, with the skill set that she had and the uh, just the, the the knowledge that she had about the organization, it's 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 so <laughs> necessary. And so we we need that everywhere we can have it, and we need to grow folks from within. Uh, and we need to provide those opportunities. So Agreed, we're, we're all about it. The reality is we can say this all day long, but our ability to really attract someone who lives in Austin today and is in that young career path that they're on, to get them to come to San Angelo it's is hard. not going to happen. It's hard. And we need to be realistic about mm-hmm. that and understand where the market is for potential employees. Because yeah. getting them from Dallas Fort Worth, probably not going to happen. That's, getting them from Austin, probably true. not going to happen. Getting them from Houston, probably not going to happen. And we can talk all day long about the quality of life that we have here in San Angelo. Yeah. But when you're early on in your career path. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and that, that goes back to one of uh, Karen's points as well, that uh, you know leadership is so important because that's how we foster that kind of growth. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we need to be all about these things because recruitment, recruiting statewide or even region-wide or nationwide is n- not the business we want to be in. Uh, it's expensive to do recruitments. It's, uh, I mean, I would rather grow our people, pay our people, keep our people. It's, it's cheaper. It's more efficient, and they know more about our organization. So, And uh, our city. Yeah. And our, yeah, and they're invested in our community, and that's you know that kind of goes back to when I was when I was city clerk, and we had the leadership San Angelo, and I, I would speak. One of the things I would always say is, you know, people look at government a certain way, right? They look at federal government, uh, and at times federal federal government can overreach. We we know that uh, state government at times can do that, but we're local government. We are your neighbors. We're your community members. We shop at the same grocery stores as you. Our kids go to school together. We live across the street. We are you. Uh, and so trying to, to make sure p- people see that both on both sides, that we're part of our community and everything we do to serve our community matters. Well, and remember, we are um, the same jobs that we need to fill are the same jobs every company in San Angelo needs to fill. Yep. Because one of the gr- conversations that Shane and Jeremy, I think, and whoever was in the room, were talking about um, CDL drivers. One of the greatest needs across the city, the state, whatever, is CDL drivers. And so one of the people from uh, Reese Albert said, we get so mad every time Michael Looney uh, brings up the subject he's recruited another trucking company to San Angelo. Because when you recruit a new trucking company to San Angelo, they all come to Reese Albert to hire their employees. And then Shane says, yeah, but whenever you do, and you, you hire our employees. Mm-hmm. So we got this little tight market for certain jobs. Mm-hmm. And we're all competing for the same people. And we need to understand that some of the competition that we have for the jobs that we need to fill are the privately owned companies within the city. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think as, you know, this being part of your strategic goals um, will allow us an opportunity to to come back and provide you an entire compensation package that um, can hopefully make us competitive. So it's not just about what happens in College Station. It's about what happens in the private companies within the city Absolutely. of San Angelo. Like I said, we're, we're data-driven. So you, you, if you have any source of data, I, I mean, I think Tommy shared something with me this week. He said, would you want this? I said, yeah, absolutely. Send it to me. More data is always good. Now, some of, you know, there's some things that are, it, that are outliers, and we, and we look for those. But, uh, you know, I'm all about the data. So 
Brian, you, you might consider calling the city of Euless. I have a, a, a good friend with whom I went to high school. It started with the city of Euless right after we graduated from high school and he retired. He went all the way up through the ranks. Um, he retired as city manager. So um, they have something going on in the city of Euless because he never worked anywhere else. Um, so I would assume they may have a, a best practices that you could at least pick their brain and see how they do They're, One of their best practices is growth. They've had growth. They've had increases. They've had tremendous increase in population and development. They're an outlier of the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and they have benefited from that in a major way. Yeah, that's, that's a good point as well, though. The succession planning can't be outside of our scope of what we're, what we're thinking. We've got to develop our own folks. Uh, okay. We've got to give them opportunities to promote, um, opportunities to prove themselves throughout the organization. I mean, uh, I'm, uh, you know, I've done that in this organization, so I, I want to make sure that opportunity is available for everybody. And we just got to locate those folks. They're here. We got to locate our next water utilities director, you know, our next city manager. We, we've got to be looking for those folks. So. Okay, now maybe we're through with you. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. I don't know where I'm at on this agenda, so somebody tell me where we're we at. We could go to Operational other. Operational efficiencies, yeah. is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Operational efficiencies, who's on? I'm on, Mayor. Okay, are you operations? No, I'm not, but this is more looking at ways that we can make improvements, streamline um, some of our services that we provide, things like that, um, to alleviate pressure on general fund expenditures. And so just kind of putting that out there as another type of way that we could decrease other types of expenditures within the general fund to free up money for other council priorities. So I don't. If, if you want to have some discussion on that, we can. If not, well, then I think we you can. need to get more specific because that's a big bullet point there. But what are you talking about specifically, Mayor? Some of the, what are the details. Some of the conversations. Uh, for example, we all know that the biggest expense is employees, right? <clears throat> some of the conversation that's been had is, of course, if it pays a certain level that you can actually recruit people that come in, you have the best people working for you. <laughs> Uh, you may not have, you may not need the five individuals that are working uh, in a certain area, a certain field. You may need four people, the four, four of the better paid people, four of the best people we possibly have in those positions. So we have to take a look at, from an oper operational standpoint, the, the biggest expense that we have is staff. How do we make that more efficient, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, do we require five individuals because they're just not mm -hmm. as, as good as uh, the four that you would pay a little bit higher and actually would come in with better skills? Or, you know, so those are the type of things we have to take a look at. It's going to be efficiencies across the whole, uh, across the board. Uh, but, of course, employees is going to be one of them. But it's other efficiencies. You talked about that a while ago, Mary. You talked about the automation. You talked about the software and, and hardware that we can actually acquire to make uh, staff more efficient. There's different things that we can be doing to make sure that we can actually reduce our expenditures in that area. We just wanted to put it up there as, as something uh, to let city council members know that we are looking at this uh, very, very closely. We have in the past, don't get me wrong, but especially now that we have those, uh, those hiccups or those challenges, with the, we talked about the 3.5% limitation. We have a lot of things that we have to get accomplished, and we have to take a much, much closer dive and look into all of this and see what we can do to really reduce some of those expenditures. To the subject we talked about earlier about the number of facilities mm -hmm. that we operate in the city of San Angelo that other cities don't operate. Yes, ma'am. So that would be one topic of conversation. So we need to have at one of the next meetings mm -hmm. that laundry list of what those facilities are, what the options for those facilities are, whether it's a private-public partnership or whether it's still going to have to stay under the umbrella of the city's oversight or looking for partners to help us run it. Um, Absolutely right. There are, we mentioned it before, some wonderful private-public partnerships. We don't have enough of them. Mm -hmm. And part of that reason is because we don't have a lot of large corporations in this city. And so it's the entrepreneurial group of people in this city that are running their own businesses that are stepping up and helping to fund some of these want lists that aren't need, must have, need to have, but want list things that we have. And what are they? Where can we look for some partnerships? And how do we reach out to the public to say, this is one of your pet projects, you're passionate about it, 
Um, what do you think about what? We've got to get creative in that area. Yes, and and we, I know we have the ability to, but we've got to get creative. Yes, ma'am, we definitely agree with that as well. So those are very good points. And yes, we did present several years back to previous council uh, a list of those services that we do provide mm -hmm. to determine whether are those services, again, you just said it, Mayor, can they be passed on to a nonprofit or somebody that could actually do it better? Why are we running that service? You know, so there's a lot of questions that need to be asked uh, to determine those efficiencies. But you're, you know, you're right as far as your, your overview. Okay, so with that, moving on to other funding sources. One, the rolling debt. So the rolling debt is a strategy. Oh, sorry. Brian turned it on for me, and then I turned it off. <laughs> sorry. Um, so that's a strategy to finance equipment replacement um, type needs um, in, in order to free up general fund funding for other council priorities. Um, Vince uh, Vial, our um, financial advisor came and talked to y'all last budget cycle about how that would work and that would um, be basically a debt issue every other year um, and it would uh, serve capacity in perpetuity as far as what Vince has told us and so just just throwing out another idea for freeing up funding for other things and um, we have I think it would free up about two million dollars per year in the general fund if we did implement a program like that so and that rolling debt, I believe, is the $1.6 million we've invested in the animal shelter. Is that correct? We have um, issued two short-term notes so far, and, and that's kind of a placeholder for something like this program. Um, the first debt issue went for the traffic signal at Twin Mountain Lane, I believe, as well as $1.6 million for the animal shelter. The second Which one... Which reminds me, we will want an update on where we're at on that $1.6 million on the animal shelter, time-wise, time wise what's happening with it, and then number two, the benefits of it, because we've, we've put the debt out there to support it. We haven't seen the benefit and the end result of what it's done to improve the facility and help with the animal shelter thing. So we're, we're going to need an update on that. Okay. And then the second short-term debt issue um, went for some streets projects. I think Patrick was... Well, it was a big a project. overlay in Chadburn. Yes. Well, so the number the one second. grant we've ever received is the one we approved funding for at last city council meeting, yes, which is singularly the largest. And that came about, first of all, because of the work that they did, but the grant writer that we had to write it. And it ended up producing one of the best packages we've ever received. Mm -hmm. And we need to take that information and make sure we use it for other grant opportunities. Because yes, we'll never come up with that $30 million dollars any other way other than through grants based off of revenues. Yes, Karen. Just a comment because it's a, it's the correct moment to insert this. Patrick and uh, Shane are excellent at their job at understanding what's needed, but the addition of the grant writer is perfect evidence of investing in a specialist or a leader and how that pays for itself. So just wanted to underscore that. Thank you. So you both stole my thunder on my next okay, bullet well, point. <laughs> we'll take it back. <laughs> no, that's that's kind of what our, the next bullet point was about, is that the, the impact that that grant writer had on the organization and um, how much um, good it did for the community. So. Does, but I also, go ahead. Go ahead, finish. Can she work in other <clears throat> areas besides? Right now you? she's strictly in doing public works types grants. Well, the largest, my, yes, Patrick but the largest, is not sharing. But the largest grants that are out there are infrastructure grants. That's, that's bottom line. Yeah, that's correct. correct. But the other thing I want to bring up about that, because it's very key, and it's one of the reasons we voted like we did a meeting ago for the additional $10 million that they need for matching the matching grants required mm -hmm. for that, and that is we had available money for the matching grant piece of it to a large degree. Because applying for these grants is one thing, but they all have matching monies obligated to make them happen. Mm -hmm. And what we have had available are those funds. Because mm -hmm. if we can't come up with the money, nope. we can't receive the, the grant. You gotta have skin in the game, Mayor. You gotta have skin in the game. <laughs> so we gotta keep mm -hmm. that in mind as we go through this planning uh, process is don't strip us 
of the skin we need for the game we go. play. Okay? <laughs> don't take it away. That's our key takeaway. Yeah. 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 Don't, don't take the scallop to it. <laughs> so let me ask, it's just a point of clarification for me. We're talking about the grant writer. Is that person available to other departments? Or do, is that person solely? I, I think I the number the of infrastructure grants that are available under Public Works keeps her pretty busy. And I believe they're looking at about 35 different grants uh, that, that, quite frankly, that we're targeting, really. And that's where she would best be served, actually. So, yeah. And that's the, and the mayor's if, correct. If, that's what we if have somebody else that. has a potential possibility for a grant, to whom would they go? That person? No. Depends on Typically the area it would, that yeah. that grant's for. Is it for parks? Right. Whatever it's for, we would look within that structure to say, how do we do it? And Typically, if there is that no director one slash that manager would be the project manager slash grant writer in, in any other department just, at this point in time. We've just written them ourselves. Yeah. Okay. So we, and we put a group together, yeah. two, three, four people who brainstorm about it and how best to go about it. Like the one you recently saw, we were trying to get riverbank stabilization and the trails and the urban. We uh, heard back from that one. We didn't receive it. Sandra was able to coordinate just this week a follow-up with them, which took an effort to try to get them to commit to that, to ask, okay, how can we alter ours if you have another round to make it consistent? So we do that as best we can within the departments. And it is like the police department. They have their own specialists that can actually uh, apply for those grants as well. And we just approved um, last meeting, I think, again, two grants for the fire department and the police yeah, department mm -hmm. uh, for some state funds, if I'm not mistaken. So correct. everyone's looking at it. It is those increased revenues that we need to make sure we get these projects taken care of. Okay. Is that it, Tina, uh, on that? Lastly, yes, that's it. No, I just meant on that. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So the last two slides that I have for you um, are related to the comparable cities that we discussed earlier. I told you we'd have a, a more in-depth discussion on that um, later on in the presentation. So um, we use comparable cities for a lot of things um, within, it, within internally as far as staff goes. Um, we use them for fee review, sales tax trends, property tax base and rate, the org chart and reporting structure, FTE counts and service levels, and then employee pay. Um, and so it's important for us to, I mean, with any other um, business or organization, you would fail yourself if you're not looking at what other businesses in your competitive market are doing right. So it's similar to that in that we have to look at what our other cities are doing that are similar to us in nature. Um, and for that reason, we would like to have a discussion of what city council thinks makes sense as far as comp cities. Mayor, you mentioned College Station earlier. Well, Certainly, I mentioned Brian that to, did, to Karen. I the support other, that. Yeah, and I mentioned that to Karen and Larry the other day when I met with them as well. Um, I think that's a good comp city. I think this list of um, amenities or, you know, whatever, however you want to call that, factors related to cities is a good way to think about how we compare with other cities. And so just wanted to throw those ideas out there, have some discussion, and kind of come up with a, a list that makes sense. Well, one of the us, reasons so. that... Uh, Wichita Falls, because everybody always looks at it and goes, why did, why are you comparing it to Wichita Falls? Well, Alvin New added that to the mix because of the following things. They're 100,000 population approximately. They have a military base. They're rural. They have, I mean, many of the things that, that Wichita Falls has is comparable to San Angelo. So it's not just about regional because we can't compare ourselves to Midland, Odessa. It's ridiculous to even have them in the mix. Um, so, I think Abilene is also similar in that way. Yeah. You know, population, university, uh, military base, um, perhaps Colleen. Um, they also have a military base. So just, I mean, whatever, whatever you all think, I think this is a good opportunity to discuss what makes sense for us to actually compare with. So. And, and we're not asking for you to give us right. cities. Mayor. I was going to say, because yeah. don't, because yeah. no, we no. haven't done our homework. No, no. yeah. I was, have it's, our, it's our job to do the homework. That's kind of what this, yeah. this list is for us to kind of generate some thought, um, give you some ideas on what, what we should consider when looking at that, and maybe come back at another meeting and talk about what makes sense. Well, I think we should. Absolutely. And I think the things that you have here are very important. Um, I think the, the elements that are missing here are issues that uh, are, have been very inclusive in the housing study that was done. And those are the, the things that we have to keep in mind when we're talking about 
housing in this city? What's the average median income? What's, what does someone pay for a one bedroom or two bedroom apartment? What percent of that goes into their cost of housing? You know, we always, for me, quality of life starts with number one thing, the door you walk through when you come home at night. It's that door. Is it an apartment? Is it a townhouse? Is it a duplex? Is it a brand new house? Is it a remodeled house? Housing is the biggest quality of life factor that will ever impact your workforce. And we've got to keep a focus on housing. That's why I want the housing study, but beyond all other studies done first. Because that's how we get workforce. That's where comp in, uh, pay comes into play. It's what people can afford. It's what the mix of our city is composed of. How does our median income compare to these cities that we're going to select? Okay. Key is income. Well, uh, that's income. The yes, ma'am. We got to study that. That's how we determine how the the housing market determines the house that they choose to build, the project that they choose to build out is what is the market? What can the market afford? What's the price point they want? What do they want within that price point? You know, we are up here having opinions about things, which is great, but the people who have their boots on the ground, who work with our population day in and day out to provide what they want, tell us more about our community than any of us up here can tell you. Because that's their living, that's their livelihood. Their, the real estate market, what does the real estate market tell us? That housing study is key. We got to get it updated. And I, I don't, and correct me on this because I kind of forget, but the city didn't pay for that housing study. I think we paid for it initially and then we're compensated back through and that went to the, the COSA DC or whatever. And I think Michael Looney at some point has even said that maybe the economic development people could come up with some funding. That housing study has got to be a key priority above any other study that we do. And it housing. Did go to, it did go to COSA DC. America. That's what I thought. Uh -huh. But we need to, to focus on that. Are we... Are we the city, city council, do we understand what the public wants, quality of life, that front door they walk through? Are we building those or are we not a, can't build them because the cost of building has uh, reached at such a point that we're not delivering what we should be delivering because the cost of whatever it is, land prices, permits, commodities, whatever it is, what do we do to ensure Again, what was the percent of the residential property tax dollars compared to everything else? It's 70%, 69%? 67, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Correct. Okay, so that's large. Mm -hmm. We got to remember that. Because sales tax dollars are driven by home buyers. They just are. They buy all those things, TVs, appliances, curtains, furniture, you know, we women who have to, you know, if you change up the carpet in the room, you got to buy all those other new things that go with it, right? You can't just paint the wall. It's true. So it's expensive. Yeah. So let's keep in mind that. Let's not get off base here and, and think we can do certain things that are going to have a negative impact on what happens in this city. That front door is key. Whether it's a home, a duplex, an apartment, a townhome, and then to Karen's point about the um, study, it will tell us if we need to relook at some market areas and say we need more uh, duplexes and townhouses, we need more zero lot lines, we need what does that housing market tell us we need to do before we do a comprehensive plan? Get comprehensive plan should reflect a housing study and the zoning that goes with that. Absolutely. <laughs> so let's keep, you know, that focus mm -hmm. in line with the end goal here. Not to overcomplicate, but would a housing study also include um, the ad adjunctive desires of potential property owners? 
sidewalks? No, it really what it really does and what it did do, Karen, was it said, here's what you currently have. Here is the hole that mm -hmm. exists in terms of need. And so it's a combination of visiting with realtors, with property, I mean, developers, um, what they're finding. But it really importantly talked about, here's the income in this city. Here's the price. Uh, what percentage of that income goes towards an apartment, a mortgage, all of that stuff. It gives you that forecast in terms of what is existing and what the need for development going forward is. And that's how people then made some decisions, if you will, over this past year about building some duplexes, building some townhouses, um, more zero lot line properties, if you will, uh, the importance of the backyard relative to the front yard. I mean, things that are hugely important to providing quality of life. So we can ask to have inclusive. You talked about the yard, so it does imply that those other things are issues. So, for example, Lucy decides to buy a zero lot line property in her retirement or whatever. Um, that does, she's already enjoying. That, <laughs> does Lucy want to buy the property that has a sidewalk mm -hmm. or no sidewalk? Does she want the property that has a tree or no tree? Um, because those will factor mm -hmm. into decisions. You buy a house, you ask those questions, you direct the realtor to, to yeah. say, don't show me a property unless it has a mature tree or yeah. whatever. I mean, it just is a fact of life. So those are quality of life issues, mm -hmm. and you basically pointed at it when you called out the yard. You know, do mm -hmm. we want a yard or no yard? Yeah. Well, number one, and I'm not the builder and I'm not the developer, but I think most people start with, I want about this much square footage, I need this many bedrooms, I need this many bathrooms. I want an open floor plan. I don't want an open floor plan. I want, you know, the number one thing people look for, I think, are bedrooms and bathrooms. How many bedrooms do I need? How many bathrooms do I want? Um, how much square footage do I want? Now, once those things are established, what else can I get for the money I have to spend? And decisions are made about whether I want a mature tree, a backyard, a front yard, based off... I only have this amount of money to spend. What does it buy me in this marketplace? No tree. Yeah. Just yeah. so saying. Okay. Mary Lucy is all about the sidewalks, by the way. All about the sidewalks. One sidewalk in particular. And one in particular, yeah. Not about sidewalks, one yeah. in particular. Yeah. The whole city. <laughs> only one. Okay, so um, those are the things that we really must study. What is the average income in this city compared to these other cities? Because dollars speak, dollars spend. We gotta understand that. Yes. Okay. That's it. That concludes the agenda, I believe. Uh, the big uh, item out there is the set date for follow up for mm -hmm. workshop. I would say not before the end of April, beginning of May. Because this meeting is four months earlier than we've ever had before. How about, Mayor, um, instead of deciding right now, let me bring it back for the next city council meeting, and then we can have the discussion there. Okay. So, okay. That'd, That'd be would, fine. Okay. Perfect. With that, I guess I need a motion for adjournment, although we haven't done much motion making, so maybe we don't need a motion for adjournment. We'll just adjourn. Still so moved. Okay, so moved, so, moved, so seconded. <laughs> Everybody? <laughs> I or unanimous. yay? Unanimous. Thank you, everyone, for your time and patience for my verbiage. Thank you, Mayor.